Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is Board President Sonia Early of the California Physician Assistant Board. I would like to call the meeting to order at approximately 8.32. Uh, today's date is August 9th, 2024. Uh, Ms. LaFort, congratulations. You. Would you like to call would you like to call the roll? Yes. <coughs> Present. Juan Armenta. Sonia Early. Present. Uh, Here. Present. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. LaFort. And we have a quorum present. The first action item on the agenda is consideration uh, for approval of the May 20th, 2024 board meeting minutes. Uh, I trust that everyone has had an opportunity to review the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes for May 20th, 2024? This is Dan, I make a motion to approve the 2024 board mini minutes. Excellent, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public comment? All right, Ms. LaFort, will you call the roll for a vote? Charles Alexander? Aye. Sonia Aye. 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 Excellent. The meeting um, minutes stand approved as read. We will move to agenda item number four. Public comment on items uh, not on the agenda. Uh, the board may not discuss or take any action on any matter raised during this public comment section that is not included on the agenda except to decide whether to place the matter on an agenda, on the agenda for a future meeting. Are there any questions uh, from the board members? Only my apologies for being late now. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Is there any public comment from the room? Okay, excellent. We'll move on to agenda item number five, the president's report. <laughs> Um, the board leadership continues to meet regularly with our EO, Ms. Khan, and our assistant EO, Ms. Wung, uh, council uh, when needed, and to discuss any pertinent information during the months between the, the meetings. I appreciate all who attend uh, for their wisdom, counsel, and discussion. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Randy Hawkins, past president of the Medical Board of California. Uh, he was an, also an invaluable member to the California Physician Assistant Board. We received information um, at our last meeting that he had completed his term as president of the medical board and um, would uh, and would not be returning. And so today, I just wanted to give him a special shout out and appreciation for his wisdom, his depth of med medical depth, and uh, to, to address any complex issues. Um, that were important to both boards, uh, both the Medical Board of California and the California Physician Assistant Board, and we thank him for his service. With that said, the Physician Assistant Board has a new board member, Dr. Sai. He's not in attendance today, but he's an ex-officio member from the Medical Board of California, and I believe that Dr. Sai will be here at our next meeting in November, um, and we will be able to share a brief bio and then also uh, give him the oath of office at that time. And lastly, uh, with utmost importance, uh, we received word a few weeks ago that the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, approved the regulatory package for the SB 697 implementation rulemaking file and will have an effective date of October 1st, 2024. Thank you uh, all for your hard work. Um, and senior counsel, uh, Christy Shields, for directing us, uh, directing the board accurately and expeditiously. Um, do we have any questions or comments? I, I echo everything you just said. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Hawkins. Um, 
and to the board members um, for the regulatory uh, package being passed. It's, uh, it's great for the profession, it's great for patients, and it's great for the physician and PA teams. Excellent. Any comments from the floor? Okay. So we'll move on to uh, item number six, the executive officer report by Ms. Khan. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start off with personnel. On June 25th, 2024, interviews were conducted to fill the vacant office technician position, which will provide technical and clerical support to the enforcement and licensing programs. Currently, staff is conducting reference checks for the top candidates, and we anticipate filling the position soon. Next up is the 2025 Sunset Review. On June 21st, 2024, staff received the 2025 Sunset Questionnaire from the Joint Oversight Committee. Since then, our team has been diligently working to provide thorough and accurate responses to each question. The draft report with responses to date will be discussed under Agenda Item 10. C is uh, annual report. As the fiscal year 23-24 concluded, staff began working on the annual report to the Department of Consumer Affairs, DCA. The board's narrative portion of the report was submitted to DCA on July 17, 2024. The annual report is an opportunity for the board to demonstrate its accomplishments, provide program information such as position counts, board membership, license requirements, fees, continuing educa education, licensing and enforcement statistics, and updates on regulations and re legislation <coughs> over the past 12 months. The report will undergo DCA's review and approval process before publication. Lastly, outreach. The board, st uh, board staff is planning to attend the annual California Academy of Physician Associates CAPA conference during Physician Assistant Week, October 3rd through the 6th, 2024 in Burbank. This event is a vital opportunity for in-person outreach, allowing board staff to address inquiries from licensees and students and provide updates on the laws and regulations governing the physician assistant practice. We are grateful to, uh, to CAPA for the opportunity in, to engage directly from the community and enhance our out, outreach <coughs> efforts. On June 27th, the board published this biannual online physician assistant board insider newsletter for summer 2024. This newsletter is an interactive communication tool for applicants, licensees, and consumers to disseminate current up updated board-related information. That concludes my report. I will take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Are there any comments from the board members? Comments from the floor? Excellent, thank you again. Uh, because we have limited staff covering today, um, I will take a few items out of order to obtain a better flow. <coughs> and the next item I have taken in consideration the stakeholders' views as well as deeply considered California consumers. I have listened to all and reviewed literature and further researched the issue and found in my review that this issue dates back to further um, to past 2007, where there was an increase from uh, uh, increase in ratios from one to two to one to four, but it has initially been brought up in 2005. Sunset Review Package by the Joint Legislation Sunset Review Committee. I will be listing item number 12. Item number 12. <laughs> item number 12. And this I've taken deeply in consideration, as well as deeply considered California consumers, um, and listened to several um, uh, people um, across the, the gamut, um, and received information earlier um, that this issue was initially taken up in 2007, but after my review, I found that it was actually uh, brought up in the 2005 Sunset Review Package by the Joint Legislation Sunset Review Committee. Um, <coughs> I have provided the information in detail to Vice President Kidd, and he will further present this information on discuss regarding physician assistant supervising ratio requirement. Vice President Kidd. Thank you, uh, President Early, and thank you, board members and uh, community at large. Uh, for this presentation, I've put in snippets from my published op-ed article in the Curious Medical Journal, which was published on 523-2024. 
The title of the article is Revisiting California's Supervising Physician to Physician Assistant Ratio Requirement and Urgent Call to Action. This presentation will contain information from the background paper for the Physician Assistant Committee Oversight Hearing dated March 19, 2012, Senate Committee on Business, Professions, and Economic Development. In addition, this presentation contains statements from the Physician Assistant Board 2024 to 2028 Strategic Plan and data from the national conferences of state legislatures. I hope to make a compelling case that under the board's legislative mandate, it is the board's duty to ensure medical care access. California, like many other states, is facing a severe shortage of primary care physicians and access to primary care is uneven across the state. It is well documented that California has the highest number of designated primary care health professional shortage areas in the country. Although physician assistants and nurse practitioners are estimated to make up a large portion of California's primary care workforce by 2030, many Californians will continue to have insufficient access to primary care provider. The statewide primary care health care shortage will likely exacerbate health care disparities among black and brown communities which are vulnerable to poor health outcomes. When patients don't have timely access to primary care, they tend to use the emergency room as a de facto primary care centers, which has negative effects on the healthcare system. One of the ways to help improve access to primary care and to other specialties is to revise the numerical limit on the number of PAs a physician may supervise in California. According to Business and Professions Code 3516B, a physician and surgeon shall not supervise more than four PAs at any given time. So concurrently, the one to four ratio has been in effect since 2008 and only applies to PAs who prescribe medication or provide direct patient care. I would talk more about how we arrived at the one to four later in this presentation. During the coronavirus pandemic, the Department of Consumer Affairs issued a temporary state level waiver on 3-30-2020, uh, suspending the racial requirement of four PAs for any supervising physician. The waiver was widely celebrated by many organizations, and there was a statement by the California Medical Association which posted an article on their website that reads in part, physicians can now supervise the number of NPs and PAs they can competently and confidently supervise without a statutory ratio in place. Although the waivers were rescinded following the termination of the state of the emergency back in 2023, the California Physician Assistant Board did not receive any complaints or concerns associated with a physician supervising more than four PAs simultaneously during the nearly three year temporary suspension of the ratio requirement. This is not surprising, as there's no publicly available data or evidence underpinning the need for maintaining the current physician to PA supervision ratio in California. In fact, 20 other states have eliminated the strict physician to PA supervision ratio requirements. Although 29 states do maintain a physician to PA supervision ratio requirements, 45% or 13 of the 29 states have um, increased the number of PAs a single physician may supervise or collaborate with at any one time. For example, Arizona has increased the supervising physician to PA ratio from one to four to one to six. Colorado has increased it from one to four to one to eight. Florida has increased it from one to four to one to 10. Illinois has increased it from one to five to one to seven. Louisiana has increased from one to four to one to eight. Oklahoma has increased from one to four to one to six. Pennsylvania from one to four to one to six. Washington has increased their physician to PA ratio from one to five to one to 10. In addition, Washington and South Carolina do allow a physician to petition for a waiver to exceed the maximum ratio requirement. Uh, Vice President Kate, can I ask a question now or would you like me to wait? Uh, I would like you to wait till I'm done. Sure. That way I don't lose my place, thanks. Although some may argue against altering the longstanding physician to PA supervision ratio, there is no clear empirical evidence that California's legislated physician to PA supervision ratio reduces health care costs, improves patient safety, or supports better patient outcomes. 
Additionally, emerging research suggests that removing restrictive laws and regulations to PA practice does not increase overall risk to patients or leads to an increased risk of medical malpractice. Lastly, a recent published national straw poll found that 91% of the United States adults say that PAs provide safe and effective care, and these consumers support updating PA laws to ensure healthcare systems fully utilize their healthcare workforce. I took the liberty to prepare some questions and responses for the board. Will increasing the supervising <laughs> physician to PA ratio lead to changes in the scope of practice for PAs? The answer is no. There would be no changes in how physicians and PA teams function today in providing quality care to their patients and their families. Is there a fiscal impact associated with increasing the PA supervision ratio? That answer also is no. There's no anticipated fiscal impact of increasing the PA supervision ratio. Would increasing the PA supervision ratio lead to an increase in the annual rate of serious disciplinary actions? There is no published data to indicate that increasing the physician assistant supervision ratio would lead to an increase in disciplinary actions. As a friendly reminder to the board, there wasn't a single documented complaint filed or in an investigation of a physician supervising more than four PAs concurrently during the COVID pandemic. In fact, there is no published literature demonstrating an annual rate increase in serious disciplinary actions from states who have either increased their PA supervision ratio or those who have eliminated it. Fourthly, is there a precedent for including a recommendation for increasing California's current PA supervision ratio in the upcoming sunset report? The answer is yes. According to the background paper for the Physician Assistant Committee Oversight Hearing, March 19, 2012, Senate Committee on Business Professions and Economic Development, the document reads in part, in 2005, the Physician Assistant Committee, which is what we were formerly known as, was reviewed by the Joint Legislative Sunset Review Committee. The Sunset Committee raised 13 issues during the review. One of those issues involved the greater utilization of the profession. Specifically, the Joint Legislative Sunset Review Committee raised the issue of whether the Physician Assistant Committee was meeting its legislative mandate to the state to, which would allow for the development of programs for education and training of physician assistants. The passage of AB3 in 2008 allowed supervising physicians the authority to supervise four PAs at any one time instead of two. This change, according to the document, provided more opportunity for PAs to be utilized in California and is essential to meet the growing demand for healthcare. Similar language is found in our Physician Assistant Board 2024 Strategic Plan and message in, in the introduction to the document by Board Armenta when he was president in 2023. The board, and, and I'll, I'll quote uh, Board Ar <laughs> Juan Armenta on this, the board believes the strategic plan creates an environment that will further medical care access, expand education and training opportunities, protect the public, and will result in improved economic efficiency in the board's operation. As public servants, the board members appreciate the board's duty to protect the public while improving medical care access. So then, to my colleagues here on the board, how does a 16-year-old physician assistant ratio of one to four for PAs improve medical care access in 2024 and beyond? I would argue it doesn't. In California, there are a total of 4,023 certified PAs in which only 2,555 are in primary care, a decrease of 2.9% from 2019 to 2023, according to the National Commission on Certification of the Physician Assistant. There is no evidence that the outdated one to four PA supervision ratio improves utilization of physician assistance by physicians throughout the state, especially in underserved areas of the state, which is a legislative mandate by the board. It is not the job of the constituent organization to help the board with the legislative mandate. It is the board's responsibility to ensure utilization of PAs um, by physicians. Therefore, for the physician assistant board to meet its legislative mandate, by improving access to care to California patients through the utilization of physician assistance by physicians to meet the growing demand for healthcare, especially in underserved areas of the state, the board must raise this as a new issue in the Sunset Review Report. 
This would involve an increase in the physician to PA supervision ratio. Madam President, I yield back. Thank you, Vice President Kidd, for that detailed summary of information. Are there any questions from the board members? Well, I've got plenty. Um, so, Vasco, you indicated one state that included this in their sunset bill. What state was that? I never, I never mentioned that. There, that. I never mentioned that any state included that in their sunset I bill. I you said there was precedent for being included in the sunset bill. I, I was referring to the sunset that occurred with the physician assistant committee. So in the physician, so let me read that to you again. So okay. I may have read that a little fast. So I may have read that a little fast. So my apologies. But the, I, I, there's, I'm not aware of any state that is included in their sunset. I haven't reviewed all of the states to know if they've included it in their sunset or how they arrived at either eliminating uh, the physician to PA supervision ratio or whether or how they increased it. Okay. There's a number of states that have <clears throat> went through different mechanisms. The the point that I am making, though, is in order to improve access to care in those states, they either improved the physician to PA supervision ratio or completely eliminated it. Okay. That's the point. Because the way I read it, you said, is there a precedent for including it in a sunset bill? And I, I just heard. Yeah. You were going fast. And I heard <laughs> that, that somehow a board such as ours, which our mandate is to protection of the public, somehow stepped into policy to say, this is how we should change the bill to change access or other supervision ratios. That's never happened. Um, no, so, so, so what I'm, so, so let me just read that statement again if I can for clarification. Okay. Fourthly, is there a president for including a recommendation for increasing California's current PA supervision ratio in, in our upcoming sunset report? Okay, that's what I <laughs> so, so who, who made that recommendation? So um, there was, so the, according to the background paper for the Physician Assistant Committee Oversight Hearing March 19, 2012. So the assembly. Correct. So, so, so the point that I'm making here is that we do have a legislative mandate. That's the point that I'm making. As a board, we have a legislative mandate, which you spoke to in the preamble of the document for the strategic planning for 2024 well, to no, 2028. I, I, because I, I, it's, it, I think you're misquoting me. I did not say it is our legislative This is word for word verbatim what's in the introduction it of is, the preamble of the document. It is not our legislative mandate. I'm sorry. Sir. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's off. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank we you. don't have a legislative mandate to overstep policy. And I think to the extent that that's interpreted that way, I think that's, that's not my intention. We don't, have a, we don't have a mandate to overstep policy. But that's okay. I'll, I'll get back to that. So, yeah. so, for, uh, for, so for clarity, the only place that has produced a change in policy is an assembly committee from your research? Um, I haven't researched ours the state, so I can't dogmatically speak to that. Okay, but the only example you have in your, your materials is it came from a, from a legislative committee. Yeah, so I, um, it came from a legislative committee that was, it says Joint Legislative Sunset oh. Review Committee, and what was mentioned in the document was whether or not the physician committee was meeting its legislative mandate to encourage the utilization of physician assistance by physicians in underserved areas of the state and to allow for the development of programs for education and training of physician assistants. The document suggested that this was a legislative mandate. You used the same oh, wording. I, I agree. It's you, a legislative yeah, mandate. Yeah, and, and if, I, if I may f uh, finish, the verbiage that was in the preamble of the document for our 2024 2028 actually speaks to that legislative mandate. And it's nearly identical to some of the verbiage that's in the document that we read when we looked at the archives. So the point that I'm making here um, is, is simply, uh, and, and I'll go back to it. If the board members can answer this question for me, I think that would be the easy thing, which is how does a 16-year-old physician assistant ratio of one to four for PAs improve medical care access in 2024 and beyond? This is 16 years old. Other states within the last seven years, all those racial requirements that I read for those other states, that occurred within the last seven years. We've done nothing to improve the physician to PA ratio in 16 years for prescribers and those who provide direct patient care. I don't necessarily disagree with policy, okay? I don't have enough data, in my opinion, to make that policy judgment, all right? I think we need more data. But that's not our job. Our job is not to review data to establish statewide policy. That belongs in the legislature. That's why that recommendation came out of committee. It didn't come from a regulatory body whose mandate is specifically care of the public. Here's my concerns. Um, 
I don't think we even have any examples of boards of any type adjusting bills to include this type of change, a significant change in public policy. And I think there's a reason for that. The reason is that type of policy analysis has to come from the legislature. And I think it's particularly dangerous to put it in the sunset bill, entering an era where we are facing significant deficits. And let's not. And health care providers as well, right? I understand. A that. crippling primary care crisis. I understand that. But our assembly members and Senate are not just looking at health care. They are looking at every issue on the table facing the state. And every issue on the table facing the state comes down to budget, period. Everything we do comes down to budget. So when you go to a sunset bill and we show a board that is willing to overstep its bounds and enter it into error of policy, I can tell you from knowing many senators and assemblymen on a personal basis, some of them since they were children, it's really easy for them to say, why do we need this board? It's under the medical board before. I don't think that's a good idea um, to, to, to venture into, into that area. May I address that, uh, Mr. Armenta? So, well, I, let, me, I, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. I, I give you the courtesy. Let me finish yeah, your comments. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I'm concerned is putting a number on it. Uh, you cited a bunch of states that increased five to eight, those areas. To ten. Yeah. yeah. And and you know, again, they went through a vetting process, uh, policy of, of what number would be appropriate. Um, Sixteen is pretty dramatic. Uh, and although my evidence would be anecdotic, anecdotal, similar to yours, um, I have seen, because I live in a, in a, well, I don't think it's very rural, but a lot of people do consider the desert rural, okay? <laughs> uh, the Palm Springs area. Um, it's a nice rural area, though. Well, <laughs> it has enough traffic to make it not feel rural. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but um, particularly in the high desert areas um, and further towards the Arizona border, uh, and south, particularly, down towards the El Centro area. There are doctors who supervise uh, PAs, um, uh, and often these are uh, uh, Mexican migrant workers because of all the ag we have out there. And I can tell you, I'd say 60, 70 percent of them don't even know they're being seen by a PA. They say doctor because they come into the room with a white coat and that communication is not clear. And one over the years, over the 30 years of practice, I've looked into uh, uh, these types of situations. The MDs themselves are hands off. The patients never even see them, don't even know who they are. Now, in the environments I think most of you guys practice in, in, in a hospital, large hospital environments, everything else, yeah, protocols are going to protect any type of stuff. But what I fear in, in increasing, and this is policy, but what I fear in increasing a ratio uh, uh, is that you will have a doctor that is retired and says, oh, well, I get paid by 16 PAs? Pfft, great. I can just do hands-off now that our regulations allow pretty hands-off supervision. Uh, that that will become a money-making opportunity for some doctors and some PAs. And I think that is a problem. But again, that is anecdotal evidence. It is policy that requires vetting at the, at the capital level, not at a, how many member board are we at max? Seven? Ten. Uh, ten. Ten at max. A ten-person board versus all our senators and assemblymen with all their staffs, with all the resources to vet policy, I don't think we should be venturing into that. Policy is for the legislature, not for us. Uh, Mr. Uh, Armenta, thank you for your comments. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I don't want to conflate the issues between personal experiences in the high desert versus what we're seeing across the state. Um, I would say this, that um, there are a number of legislative activities around primary care. We see that Nurse practitioners will be practicing without physician supervision, and there's an AB 890 bill that actually speaks to that, and there's a cleanup bill coming through the committee right now, Senate Bill 1451, which will operationalize that once passed and signed. So 
The idea, and by the way, that bill does not subject nurse practitioners to ratio requirements, the same ratio requirements that PAs currently have today. So the idea that you're, you, if you're concerned about PAs, and I'm sure you'd be concerned about anyone who you think may not necessarily, you know, if there's some type of economic interest. But I would say this, that both PAs and NPs practice quality care. I think the evidence supports that. Um, the other thing I would make um, a recommendation here is that there's nothing wrong with asking the legislature to revisit the physician assistant PA ratio. We can do that. That's why we have uh, a sunset review so that we can raise it as a new issue. We're raising other things as a new issue. There's been other boards that have raised um, other, uh, you know, uh, subjects that may not necessarily be part and partial, like making the waivers permanent. When we had some of the COVID state level waivers, some of the boards asked during their sunset period to have some of those waivers made permanent. But let me go back to something you said, which is your concern about kind of physicians being hands off and they're being kind of, uh, I think you were alluding to an increase in kind of either a disciplinary action or medical malpractice that wasn't seen during the COVID pandemic. For nearly three years, we had physicians in practicing out of ratio, meaning that they were supervising more than four PAs. And in fact, the state level waiver also allowed PAs to practice without a practice agreement. So that was also something where we didn't see any filed complaint related to a physician supervising more than four PAs concurrently. So there's no evidence over the last three years. We, we've piloted this during the COVID pandemic. By the way, we're in another COVID pandemic for all those who are out there. We're all seeing the hospitals inundated, emergency rooms inundated with COVID patients. The healthcare system is stretched. And here we are saying that the one to four ratio would lead to medical malpractice or and or disciplinary, uh, an increase in disciplinary actions when there's no evidence to support it in the published literature in states that have eliminated that requirement or increased that requirement. And we have the experience here in California of the COVID pandemic where we didn't see any issues related to the state level waivers during the three year period that it was in place. So I, am, I, I would agree to disagree with you that there is no evidence um, to support that we can't go to the legislature and ask them to reconsider the one to four ratio. It is our legislative mandate and it is our duty as a board to raise it as an issue. And it's up to the collective wisdom of the legislature to determine whether or not they want to increase the ratio and by what number. I have a number in mind that I think we have precedent for, given what we've done recently with AB 1070. I think that's a good number. AB 1070, for those who don't remember, we, we approved that as a board. And AB 1070 allows us to raise it to one to eight. And they cited, by the way, uh, the precedent of the COVID pandemic and there being no issues uh, during the COVID pandemic with how PAs and physicians, uh, you know, worked uh, in that environment, that very difficult and tenuous environment. And they raised it to one to eight for those who are practicing in home health. So if you're doing like home health assessments, but you're not providing direct patient care or prescribing medication, a physician can supervise up to eight PAs. So we have precedent already. What I would suggest would be that we include in our sunset as a new issue that we do one to eight across the board because this would apply to prescribers. That is where you have the greatest impact and that will help us to try to address the crippling primary care crisis in California. Ms. Neff? I'm sorry. Um, to prepare, I listened to, that I knew this would be an important discussion. So I listened to the last meeting with yeah. Dr. Hawkins. Yeah input to try to get some so. uh, I'm <laughs> sorry you. I hope this is um, I agree we need to raise it I just would like to see more data first um, some of the things he raised was reviewing um, well for one thing it doesn't guarantee that that the PAs will go into primary care which I don't know how you help that or not but um <laughs> that's one thing he mentioned um also just because we it's not showing discipline increases doesn't mean we should necessarily assume um how much can one physician how much work is it for one physician to supervise a pa because um, i know how busy doctors are yes they are um, and <laughs> I don't know what's entailed I'm not a doctor I don't know 
<laughs> exactly what they have to do to adequately supervise a PA. Um, that's a few things he mentioned. And if we knew a little more about those facts, I, one thing he said, I'm going to quote him, uh, we would be more comfortable yeah. raising it if we had some of those answers as to the quality of care. Um, how did, and I want to know, how did the nurse practitioners get to get theirs changed? Do you know? Yeah, so they uh, sponsored a bill. Uh, there was a bill that was sponsored, it was AB 890, uh, which allows nurse practitioners uh, once they meet uh, certain uh, requirements as a 103 NP to practice without standardized procedures, which is, you know, equivalent to a practice agreement for PAs. Uh -huh. And so that um, allows them to practice independent of physician supervision. Um, three years after that, they can become a 104 NP, which will allow them uh, to practice completely independently and even open up their own practice if they choose to. And that's within their AB 890. That's what's uh, passed a couple years ago. There's some provisions that went into effect. There's a current, there's a current bill, uh, Senate Bill 1451, which uh, I think is being authored by Senator Ashby. Uh -huh. uh, and in that bill, um, it will uh, operationalize uh, AB 890. I think there were some challenges with how AB 890 first wrote out and how it was adopted in the regulatory package. Mm -hmm. um, but that bill would provide additional access to Californians. And so, and, and I'll just, if I can, just to answer your question, um, so, so it's a cleanup bill, but according to the author of that bill, it is intended to be an omnibus bill, which includes several changes to programs reviewed through the Sunset Review Oversight Process. Senate Bill 1451 addresses a number of practice areas impacting the ability for female dominant healthcare professions to effectively provide safe and expanded access to care to California patients. That was written by the author in the preamble of the bill. So uh, the nurse practitioners found a, a, someone willing to sponsor mm -hmm. the bill? Correct. Is that how it happened? Now this, this bill though, um, Senate Bill 1451, oh, okay. actually originated from the legislature themselves. I see. Okay. Actually came out of the legislature themselves. Now we've always been told it would need to be a constituent organization, but it's uh -huh. my understanding that this actually originated from the legislature because of the access to care issues and the implementation mm -hmm. of AB 890. Uh, to answer your other question mm -hmm. about what goes into supervision of, and, and I want to make sure that everyone understands, a one to eight, a recommendation of one to eight is a recommendation, it's optional, it's not a compulsory requirement. Uh -huh. A physician would make the determination on what, how many PAs they can confidently and adequately supervise. We trust physicians with medical decisions, we trust physicians with their practice dynamics, we trust physicians with you know, providing excellent health care, why aren't we able to trust physicians to make a determination at the practice level how many PAs they can adequately and competently supervise? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the California Medical Association statement, which says now, now, right, physicians can now decide how many PAs you know, and MPs they can supervise mm -hmm. adequately and competently supervise. And I think that's absolutely true. So um, I think that there's a variety of different things that go into supervision. Mm -hmm. But again, this is not a compulsory requirement. That is an optional requirement. So if a primary care physician says, well, I'm hiring four PAs, and they're in primary care clinics, and I have the capacity to hire more, but the state's legislative ratio okay. restricts me from doing that, mm -hmm. then that doesn't expand access to care. So can they appeal that? Um, can the doctor appeal and try to get more? No. Okay. It's a flat so rate arbitrary. across the board, whether you're in hospital settings or in the outpatient setting. Okay, I remember someone said Kappa. Now, Kappa, can you help me? Oh, uh, California Academy of Physician Associates. Yeah, and we have the president our, sitting over there. It's our, <laughs> it's our like. Um, okay. okay, I thought that that it was um, mm -hmm. like, but I wanted to be sure. Okay, someone mentioned that at one point they talked to the legislature about um, increasing, and the legislature said no. Do we know when that happened? I don't, and I don't know, um, I don't have intimate details of that conversation. I wasn't a board member when that was brought before. Oh, Mike, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember no. your last name, Michael. <laughs> Michael. I'm Michael Pinot's board counsel. I, okay. I can tell you that in the process of adopting um, AB 697, uh -huh. there was a Senate, Senate Bill 697. Senate Bill 697. Yep. Thank you. Uh -huh. there, there was a 
version of the bill initially that <coughs> basically repealed the section that contained the ratio. Okay. And that provision was eventually changed to a amendment to increase the ratio to six. Mm -hmm. And then the authors, um, the author amended that out of the bill in the second house in the assembly. Okay. And it was passed without that provision. So, so the legislature looked at it twice in the context there. But if I, if I might go ahead and interject. I, yes, I, I'd like I, I need to. I, I, I need to at some point interject this. The board, I mean, the board has two basic functions. Licensing PAs so that we know that a practitioner has the education um, testing requirements mm -hmm. to have a minimum competence level in a profession. And enforcement. Protecting the public, Pro yes. And, and both of those and both of those functions protect. serve to yes. protect the public and that is codified in our statutory mandate mm -hmm. which applies to all of our activities and I'll go ahead and read the section for you it's 30 it's um, business and professions code section 3504.1 which reads protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the Physician <coughs> Assistance Board in exercising its legislative, regulatory, and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. So I, I am not going to, by any means, um, take a position on the substantive law <laughs> issue regarding, um, regarding ratios. And that's not my place at all. Um, but frankly, it's, it's also not the board's place. Um, the board, in, in looking at public protection interests, has to elevate those over any other interests. Access to care, promotion of the profession, and to the extent that the ratio is, I, I think, it's hard to argue that the ratio is not a public protection provision. Mm -hmm. And you know, regardless of what the best policy may be, that is an area that the legislature should be taking up um, on its own. And so I would, I would not recommend um, adopting a ledge proposal or placing this in um, this matter in the legislative um, the, the sunset report because frankly it's 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 arguably beyond the jurisdiction of the board and can be viewed negatively in terms of the board um, um, str striving to accomplish its statutory purpose of public protection. So thank you. That is my cautionary note. <laughs> I I do know um, some of the emphasis for this is that we're about 50 percent yeah. behind in meeting medical oh. needs yeah. and um, it's a good issue yeah. I just don't know um, who would do some of the research or or who could uh, Michael could it be suggested to a legislate uh, someone in the legislature I I don't know how or or Dr. Um, Kidd. I would I would love to I would love to do that and uh, board members know I do think we do have some evidence to support that there is movement by the states uh, to increase the ratio. We've seen that in the last seven years there's been a large tranche of states uh -huh. that have improved the ratio and a large tranche of states that currently don't have a ratio. Um, and the reason for that is they want to increase access to primary care. That's we are important. that is yeah. very important. We're going to be 3.2 million healthcare providers short coming up. Mm -hmm. So why would we be afraid to suggest to the legislature, right? Because if the point is that, that it, it should originate in the legislature, the legislature should make the decision. Then all we're doing is saying we we defer to the collective wisdom of the legislature here's a here's a one to eight that has precedent because you've already raised it to one to eight 
for those that do not prescribe and those that do not perform direct patient care. You already have a precedent for a one to eight. All we're asking is that the one to eight apply to those who are prescribing medication. And the reason why that is important, according to NCCPA data, 95% of certified PAs prescribe medications. 95%. So when we have a increase in the ratio that doesn't impact prescribers or those who provide direct, direct patient care, we're not addressing the primary care issue. And so I think, and, and again, this is my opinion, and my opinion, you know, doesn't, at the end of the day, it's, it's the collective wisdom of the board, is that we should consider raising the issue with the legislature and letting the legislature then rule on that issue again and see if they would say. And I think there's a good chance that the legislature may actually give it some credence because out of that committee, they have an access to care bill that would expand the role of nurse practitioners to meet primary care needs. So we have an opportunity to go before that exact same committee that, and, and the proponent of that committee is a proponent, excuse me, the, the person who's overseeing that committee is a proponent of access to care. Well, Ms. I'd Snow, you asked, you asked a question, the key question, which I've been arguing. Again, don't conflate policy with process. The question you asked was perfect. Who? That's a process question, okay? I'm not going to ignore our board council's advice saying that this oversteps our bounds. As a lawyer of 34 years of experience and who has participated in, in crafting legislation, I'm telling you the same thing. It's beyond our purview. So who? Real simple. If member Kidd wants to go personally and lobby, God bless him. If PAB wants to go personally and lobby a, a legislature, mazel tov. Great, fantastic, do it. As a board, it is not our function. And it is strategically dangerous, I think, to our existence entering a sunset bill with large deficits. I don't want to see this board disappear. I can see an easily in a sunset bill somebody saying, in fact, medical board even weighing in and saying, yeah, you guys don't even really need to exist now that the regulatory package is in place. Who needs you? Okay, so who and who does all that study is the legislature. That is what they are designed to do. They have huge staffs to do that and huge budgets to undertake that type of analysis. Could um, Kappa suggest that Absolutely. they, that they um, find some of the statistics? That they could even they could and, even go and, get the statistics and take and it to the legislature. Go to the legislature. So I would just say this. So I I am a little concerned, uh, Board Amenta, with the suggestion that we may disappear as a board if we suggest a one to eight ratio, in order. So so I I don't I don't think that's what we would want to kind of say publicly. I think that what we would want to think about is do we have precedent for a one to eight ratio? And the answer is we do because we have that in AB 1070. And the purpose of that was to help with some of the access to care issues for folks doing home health assessments. Um, I don't agree that we shouldn't at least broach the topic with the legislature because right now they have an access to care bill that is passed out of committee and is headed to the assembly floor for vote. This is a perfect opportunity, a perfect window. We're not, this is, at the end of the day, this is an optional requirement. Physicians don't have to hire eight PAs. They don't have to hire four PAs. They can hire as many PAs as they feel they need to hire to get the job done. Suggesting that we should not even talk about it with the legislature and not raise it as a new issue, I, I have an issue with that, to be honest, because at the end of the day, we can propose a one to eight and the legislature can just say no and that's it and we move on. I, the idea that we can't even put it in as a new issue, which by the way, these, th that's why new issues are designed for us to put things in there and not everything that goes into a new issue fits within the public man, you know, the consumer mandate bucket, right? But at the end of the day, we should at least try, we have a mandate. My recommendation to this board given the crippling primary care crisis that we are facing, is to suggest a cap increase of PA, physician to PA supervision ratio to one to eight, to include it as a new issue in our sunset report. It is an optional requirement for physicians. Again, they don't have to hire eight PAs if they choose not to. 
Well, you've, you've kind of moved all over the place here. You, first you said 1 to 16. I've never said 1 to 16. And then you said 1 to 8. I've never said 1 to 16. And then you say <laughs> don't, don't include it in the bill, but suggest it only. You said no, it of including no, it in the bill. This is no, what I'm hearing. No. So I, maybe I misunderstood you. But I yeah, you're misinterpreting what I said. I never okay. mentioned 1 to 16. There's not, by the way, Ron, there's not a single state that has 16. a 1. No, I never never mentioned 16. Well, there, 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 there's uh, just if I may finish, it's, it's, it's a 16-year-old oh, okay. outdated okay. All right. one to four ratio. But but now we're moving from putting it in the sunset bill to suggesting that the legislature consider it. Well, so in order for them to consider it, it has to be put into the sunset oh, review report. Well, then I'm going to make a motion that we don't include anything. Well, in we're not there yet. We're not so there yet. Are there any, Ms. Snow, <laughs> you have I mean, any I mean, other I mean, comments? Oh, let me Madam listen President, to Madam Michael. Madam 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 there's Michael. a motion on the floor. Uh, we're not yeah. ready. We're still doing comments. But it's a matter of procedure. I made a motion. He made a motion. That we have to ask whether there's a second. We can't conduct any business until we if ask. If we're still doing second. comments or we're still doing... Ms. Snow had no a question. Mm -hmm. We can he continue talking. There will be discussion on the motion. Oh. Yeah. And then, okay. and then we can make a, I can make a motion afterwards. Can okay. Make a motion at any time. So yeah. I would like to make a motion. Well, wait, well, wait, wait, I, I'm I confused. A what was, was your motion? motion? Is there a second? <laughs> Is can, there a second? Can you repeat your motion? Yes. That I'm we, confused. That the board not include in any sense of provision any uh, specification of ratios. I'll second it, barring more information, if, if I can I mean, say that. Or, or can we not, and then you can second it or you discuss. Can not second it. Okay, yeah, second discuss, it. Continue. Okay, so this motion has oh. been seconded, and now we're back to discussion. On and now we oh. have discussion. <coughs> we have to vote. Do we vote? We have a discussion. We can discuss, right, Mr. Oh, Mr. Cano, we I'm discuss sorry. now the motion. I'm getting Correct. confused. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Diego, I'm confusing yeah. myself. So, so first of all, I just wanted to reiterate that I think we all know that physician assistants provide quality care, yeah, and that's yes. kind of our responsibility yes. to ensure that. Yep. Um, you know, physician assistants will oftentimes more so than a doctor provide more in depth, more clear care because we are able to be there longer for patients. Um, you know, doctors are very busy. That's our role. That's what we do. Um, do I feel that there is a healthcare disparity? You know, disparity and not enough providers. Yes, I definitely agree. We need more, you know, more providers, more MPs, more PAs, uh, especially in rural communities. Absolutely. Um, I think the the difficulty lies, as, as um, Michael mentioned earlier, is that our role is primarily sure. in consumer protection. Um, so it it, it kind of comes into a little like a, a gray area whether or not we can even suggest or really push for something like this to happen or, or a change. Do I feel like a constituent organization can really push, you know, a legislature to do this? I think that's probably the best avenue. Can we support it as we have in the past with AB 1070? Yes, I think we should. But, you know, I think it's very gray on, and, and it sends the wrong message for consumer protection if we were to blatantly go out or you know really suggest that we want this to happen without even you know another organization pushing forward or legislature pushing forward saying that they want this to happen as well or even before we want it to happen i did want to assure you i would like to see it raised one to eight i just don't know the right um, protocol or the right enough d data to but, but I agree with you. I think it yeah. needs race. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, uh, I really do appreciate that, um, board members. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one of the, yeah, uh, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is we need support. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's speaking. Mm -hmm. no, no, um, I hear what you're saying, Diego, and I, I agree with you. And, um, wonderful presentation. And I really it appreciate is. the presentation. I agree with you, uh, Diego, but wonderful presentation. And as a public health educator, I am concerned about the disparity issue, the access issue. Um, the data, though, I think we definitely need da more data. I wonder what the physician's position is on this. Um, we do know the quality of education for PAs has been increased. The bar has been raised since we've been on this since I've been on this board and. So the level of training is definitely much better than 
it was during the past, let me just say that. Um, and the type and the way PAs are trained today is definitely um, high level. It's, it's the quality is much better. The concern I have, though, um, is what our attorney just mentioned in terms of what our role is. You know, we're a licensing board, we're an enforcement board, and we do support bills in terms of the legislature. But I wonder if we do this under the sunset report, if this could be raised more as a concern than a recommendation, um, mainly because we've witnessed and we watched and we've heard and you know, certainly have seen the changes that have occurred over the last 16 years yeah. that you point out. <laughs> um, and, and as a board, it, I don't know if that would be violating our, our role in terms of being concerned about it, not necessarily recommending a number or recommending how many ratios should be in place for a physician and PAs. But um, I think we have a responsibility to be concerned about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the ratios and the access and the disparities that we are seeing in the state of California. So I kind of throw that out, you know, because I, I am concerned yeah. about the access. You yeah. know, we do mm -hmm. have an access issue. You pointed Me out, too. Mr. Armenta, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that point explicitly. So anyways, um, that's, that's where uh, I kind of lie. I mean, uh, <laughs> we're licensing an enforcement board. <laughs> we're not a board that can change policy, <laughs> as you mentioned. And I think, you know, we have some representatives, I hope, in the public comments, <laughs> <laughs> you could share some light with us in terms of how the PAs feel, because uh, I think it's an important issue that yeah. we, we, we should be talk we should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. right. I would like to include that um, physician assistants, we were created some 20 years ago, uh, and we had a manpower shortage uh, at that time. We were created by physicians, um, and in 2024, we still have a manpower shortage issue, um, and it's more increased at this time. Um, this issue wasn't brought up just 16 years ago. It was brought up in 2005, so that's nearly two decades ago, um, and um, it, we still have this issue today. I believe that if we put this forth to the review, uh, Sunset Review, it will decrease cost. We won't have to wait another 20 years. We won't have to expend another, however, however much it costs for 20 years to litigate, to get this through in order to ask the legislature to just look at it again without cost. I've gone to legislative meetings by the director, um, by directors, in the state of California asking us to look at the governor's provisions to decrease you know, the amount of money that we spend. Um, this is one of those issues that we can bring this forth to the legislature without any cost or very limited cost um, and not have to wait another 20 years to have this done. So I believe it is cost savings. I also believe that it's, um, we are, as you know, everyone has mentioned that this is something that we have to look at um, really deeply um, and um, think about the best avenue to do that and think creatively and out of the box um, because what we've done in the past has not worked. So. And if I may, I'll just uh, thank you everyone for your comments. I really appreciate it. And I actually agree that we can certainly look at other venues where this could uh, potentially uh, receive a level of support. Uh, I'll make one last ditch effort uh, just because that's who I am. And <laughs> You guys can, so uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. What I would write, uh, so, so then what I would make a motion for is that we raise it as a new issue in the sunset without a ratio, without a specified ratio requirement and let the legislature take it up and review it. So what we would do is we would raise it as a concern because we're all concerned about it. We would raise it as a concern that that you know, we have a primary care issue, we would raise it as a concern, we'd leave it as a concern, and then have the legislature weigh in on it. They may say exactly what you folks have just said, or they may say, you know what, we do think that there is an issue, um, but let's at least raise it as a concern. We all agree we're concerned about it. We all agree we need access to care. We don't have to put a ratio number on it. We don't have to specify one to eight, one to six, because not everyone feels comfortable with those numbers. I'll be honest. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm hearing from the board members. But let's at least raise it as a concern, and then the legislature can take a look at it. They can decide whether or not they 
leave it at one to four or raise it. They can make that determination. So all I'm saying is let's just put it in the sunset and raise it as a concern. If I may. So, so that's the motion. <laughs> there's a motion pending. There's a motion pending already. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying, Vasco, is more in line with what I think. I think the way we do that as a matter of process, and I'm sure our board council will stomp on me and correct me. <laughs> but I think the way we do that as, as process is when the sunset bill comes to us for comment. That's when we comment and say, we can comment if the board decides, approve, neutral, whatever. Consider the ratio. I think that's the limit of our abilities. Uh, and, and I think that's the, that's the better way to approach this. And look, again, I, I don't want to, under, I want it perfectly understood. I don't disagree with the policy uh, suggestions. Uh, I think, yeah, access to care is always a good thing. Uh, but, you know, listen, so is also access to more pilots to fly. So <laughs> but the FAA puts restrictions on how many pilots, uh, how many hours pilots can do. And we don't say, well, we just trust the airlines to, to put pilots in the air safely. Come on, we don't do that. Um, so I, I think, I think a, as a matter of process, we let the parties that are supposed to do this do their job, and we comment when the bill comes back to us. That's why I made the motion that let's not specify. I don't want to. I don't want to show to other legislatures or boards that we are willing to overstep our bounds. In my opinion, in a pretty aggressive fashion. And I just want to make a comment. Um, I think, as president, I think I've been informed by council that this is an avenue uh, for us to bring it up. Uh, yeah, we were informed of that. So that's the reason why we're. Um, and so, so just to make sure that, and, and I appreciate Mike's uh, counsel, but part of that counsel also was that we could include it into right. the sunset bill. So that was, so, so, so I just want to make sure that that's stated on the record. The other right. thing I just want to, again, because I think this is really important, is if we raise it as a concern, again, we're not specifying a ratio. Because I think that's where everyone is kind of stuck, is what is that ratio? Is it one to eight, one to 10? Is it one to six? Whatever that ratio is, but we can at least raise this as a, a new point. issue, as a concern. That is not specifying a ratio. No we ratio. are concerned, so we're raising it as a new issue, as a concern that the ratio requirement, the one to four ratio requirement is 16 years old and it's concerning to us as a board because of the crippling primary care crisis. We're not specifying a number, we're just saying it is a concern. So if we're all concerned, we're saying that publicly, all of us are concerned about primary care access. We're just including it as a new issue. We're concerned about the one to four, and then it's up to the legislature as to, so that four, we're not telling the legislature, give us a one to eight, or give us a one to six. We're concerned given the crippling primary care crisis the state is facing, and seeing all of the investments the state is doing this year to address that, why not take the opportunity while the opportunity is here? Because it's five years before we come back to this again. I That's did, all I'm saying. I did like how Dr. Alexander phrased it as a concern, not a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Excellent. If, um, and maybe to say we're concerned about such a shortage in medical care, what are some ways Absolutely. we could, um, Absolutely. what are some ways that maybe could be done to increase the care. I like and, that. And, I like yeah. that. And how, without how specifying. That? I'm concerned about how would you do that? You can't you can't put in a bill. We have a question. So are we talking about directing Well, staff I think we can go to I the think I think yeah, I, I, I think can direct yeah. us. Yeah, I I'm sorry, Diego. Go sorry, ahead. sorry. I think if if anything if we were to put anything or any kind of suggestion in our sunset review, maybe it could be something like we're concerned about the um, access um, to care mm -hmm. overall. Mm -hmm. um, does that include, you know, patient ratio or, or you know, PA to, uh, to physician ratios? Yes. Does it include, yeah. you know, where our workforce is going? Yes. It can be all of these things in general. I don't think we need to focus on one thing specific, but if we were to say that we have concerns about our access to care for our consumers, then I think it's kind of a blanket statement that, you know, would show our support 
for something like something I agree with you Diego and I agree with you Debbie too good. I think that sounds great yeah. and I think you know you're right not pinpointing a specific issue but putting it all in the bucket and saying PA physician supervision ratios the distribution of the workforce where, where they're located rural versus or, so everything you said is absolutely we should be raising as a new good. issue and I think that's uh, I, I think that's appropriate. I mean that was and by the way I would like to make that motion <laughs> if it's okay well, with we, you. We have a motion on the floor, and but I might, think before uh, we do that we have to take public comments. Yes. You yes. may add to yes. to that argument yeah. coming from the education committee that the number of PA programs are decreasing. Exactly. Absolutely, mm -hmm. so absolutely, that's another factor. Another absolutely. Factor. So, so if I may, so what what I'm getting is not putting it in any bill, but in the supporting materials, mm -hmm. saying in light of the educational stress and the uh, necessity for access to care, the legislature at some opportunity should review uh, ratios. As, yes, with, mm -hmm. as a new issue in the Sunset Report. As a new issue within the Sunset Report. Yeah, as, as a concern, not, mm -hmm. not saying guys put it in the bill. Right. Let yeah. them kick it off and let them, them, let them deal with it. Let them deal with I it. I just want to add something. Um, as far as new issues are concerned, one of the examples I'm going to give you is that I want to raise the statutory uh, um, uh, level for mm -hmm. fee increases. We have to be very specific what we're asking and what code section are you trying to amend. So if you're asking for something, you have to state this is what I'm trying, this is what the um, issue is and this is what the board's uh, suggested solution is. And this time they're asking for specific code sections that either we want to amend it, change it. Um, if Michael, if you want to add to that as far as the, you know, providing language. So I know what you guys are saying, just put it in there that access to care is an issue, but what are we trying to do with that? Right. What are we, what statutory authority are we changing to right. implement that? So. I think we can ask for, you know, council's uh, wordsmithing at that time if we get there. Um, yeah. So I think those things are appropriate, but I think we're on a better, you know, trajectory, trajectory. <laughs> uh, to do that. And right now, I'd like to take public comment. Yeah. statement so I don't miss anything. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jeremy Meese. I am a, uh, I'm the president of California Academy of Physician Associates. Uh, I'm a practicing PA for 12 years. I work at a federally qualified health center serving underserved patients in Sacramento and I love what I do. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment today and thank you, PA Kid, for starting this conversation and publishing a concise, serious, and methodologically sound article calling ratios into question. In my 12 years of practice, I have clearly seen the role that ratios have played in limiting access to health care in both my role as president of Kappa as well as a practicing PA. Members of Kappa have been clear ratios limit their job prospects, especially in FQHCs, rural health centers, and under, other underserved communities. As PA Kids article points out, PAs are more likely than physicians to address primary care needs in healthcare deserts. Furthermore, over 30 peer reviewed studies have shown that PAs provide safe and effective healthcare with safety and outcomes on par with physicians. Ratios have never been proven effective for enhancing public safety. In fact, the opposite is likely true. I'd like you to consider that ratios are harmful to patients as a barrier to access. When a patient cannot access health care, their health and outcomes suffer. In real terms, this means that a teen with anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation can't get an appointment with a provider, or an adult with uncontrolled diabetes can't access basic prescriptions for insulin and other medications to prevent morbidity and mortality. Furthermore, California graduates 1,000 PAs from our from California PA programs every single year. We need places for those graduates to go so they don't leave the state to Oregon or other states that have less restrictive and safe practice laws and regulations. Supervisor, supervisory ratios should be allowed to be decided at the practice level. The state of California, through whatever means are available, 
should be expeditiously doing everything in its power to improve access to health care and eliminate unproven, unnecessary, and antiquated limitations on PA practice. As PA Kids op-ed eloquently identifies, there are already 20 states who have permanently eliminated ratio requirements. California has one of the most restrictive ratios in the nation, especially for the sake of our impoverished, unhoused, marginalized, and BIPOC communities. I hope that California can address ratios as a public health concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so I'm curious. Uh, you have a board here that I think everybody agrees that it is an issue, but we're trying to separate process from policy making. Uh, and I think you understand the distinction. Um, so let me ask you, why is not COPPA presenting a bill before the legislature if, there's all, if you have momentum on ratios, that they're inadequate, that there's health care, that all this stuff, why not just go directly to the legislature, find your sponsors and do that? Why yeah, not? absolutely, great question. Um, I mean, I, I can't commit to what CAPA's legislative priorities are for you know this, legis this upcoming legislative session. What I can tell you is that that's a um, complicated process that doesn't necessarily go the way that you intend it to go because of multiple different vested interests. And so while the it's an expensive process. Um, it's um, it's a process that that doesn't guarantee what we what what we need basically. And so while Kappa will continue to advocate for PAs and advancing our profession in the state, um, I feel that if there are whatever with whatever means we have as a state um, should be should be leveraged. Well. It's no easier doing this, as you can see, the gyrations are going over policy versus, versus uh, uh, process, and it puts us in a very difficult position. Now, the fact that it is difficult to get legislation through is by design. Yeah. Okay? That is what is supposed to happen, so that you have a democratic process. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I still haven't heard you articulate, why aren't you guys at least trying it? You're the president of, I suspect you know some machinations. Why isn't, why don't you have a bill? Why don't you have something before an assembly to do this? Sure, and I mean, on public record, I, I, just, I can't commit to what, what, what we're, you know, what, what, what plans we have for a legislative session. Okay. So Thank that's. You. Okay, I, Thank I, you. I, I do have a question. Um, as the president, would you be able to bring that back to Kappa and say, can we make this a priority? Of course, yeah, of course. I mean, that's. Uh, Advancing our profession is our number one. That we are the one and only advocacy body in the entire state, right? We're the we're we're we're, we're the we're the David <laughs> in, the, in the Goliath story, and we <laughs> we we are a um, you know I mean, Kappa is volunteer run, right? Uh, we we are I and every one of the other board members volunteer. We're all full time PAs, and uh, we have three staff members and. So it's, it's a matter of, of bandwidth and it's a matter of uh, relationships and everything else. And so, you know, we feel that, you know, hearing the testimony today, hearing that we're here talking about public safety, um, we're talking about a, a mandate for access to care and how this board can, can advance, sa can safely advance access to care with this, with this process of the sunset bill. Um, it seems that there's a place for that and there's a role for that. So we want to, as CAPA, we want to use every, we want to collaborate with you all. We want to, um, you know, be at the, at the table and we want to support any, any efforts to help get patients the care they need. Thank you so much. I think we have another public comment. Is there any more? There we go. Good morning, Melissa Gear, uh, Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations. Um, just wanted to comment after hearing the conversation this morning, I would like to reiterate that the board's mandate is uh, consumer protection. Um, I don't disagree that this conversation would not advance consumer protection, but one thing that I would caution you on is that if you were to add a new issue into your sunset report, um, it could receive opposition. 
Um, and we always encourage all of our boards and bureaus when moving through the sunset pro review process that you don't want to include issues that are going to cause opposition um, from other members because that could potentially lead to outcomes and things that you would not uh, want to occur. In addition, um, I'd lost also touch um, piggyback off of what uh, President, I believe it was Reese from CAPA mentioned, and part of his reasoning for not wanting to move a bill through the legislative process would not be any different from the board moving a bill through the legislative process. Once you put this language into the legislative process, it no longer is your language. Um, which means that any other individuals who want to comment, amend, and uh, participate in the process will have that ability to do so. Um, so your re his reasoning for why CAPA is not doing a bill now um, should also be considered when you're thinking about moving a legislative bill through the process. Um, the process is not going to be any different for you than it would be for uh, the association. So I just wanted to share that, and uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Yeah, if, if I may, I just I thank you so much, uh, Melissa. Always appreciate your insight and wisdom, and, and also to our Kappa president as well. Thank you for your collective wisdom, and 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 for Kappa for the work that they're doing in the state. Um, Melissa, I have a quick question for you. If we include this as a new issue, do we anticipate opposition? And the reason why I'm asking that question is there is already an access to care bill that is coming out of the same committee that we would be presenting our sunset report to and to the committee chair access to care is a big issue and that committee just passed out Senate bill 1451 which is going to the assembly floor the chair of that committee is a proponent of access to care so do we anticipate and, and again I don't know and that's why I'm asking the question I'm not trying okay. to put you on the spot I don't want to do that I, I, I want to be very careful not to do that would we encounter opposition because we're raising it as a concern as a new issue that since you're already looking at access to care and since you already have a bill that will operationalize AB 890 for nurse practitioners could we not look at the PAs because the PA profession is also a resource for addressing primary care issues. So would we anticipate opposition from committee because we're raising a legitimate concern about access to care? And so we're asking them just to look at the physician to PA ratio? Is that what, I mean, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding it because I'm struggling right now, so. I cannot specifically say that you're going to face opposition from the committee itself. Okay. However, you could face opposition from anybody, any other associations um, out there that have an interest or a stake um, in protecting their members, um, as well as I would probably assume um, that if there were a bill, CAPA would potentially be in support of that bill um, and in advocating, but there could be several other entities on the other side that would have a different position and may not be advocating um, in the same way and being supportive. Um, again, that's part of putting uh, language into the legislative process. You do not know, uh, once that language is out there, who's going to be supporting it, who's not going to be supporting it, um, what amendments may or may not come. Um, as a lot of people refer to the legislative process, it's like making sausage. <laughs> 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 and so, I, and that's my caution. Once it's out there, it's out there. Um, and you don't know um, who's going to be for it, who's going to be against it. Um, conversations happen publicly as well as behind closed doors. Um, so I, again, that's just my caution as you have this conversation and you move forward. One more question, just one more, I promise. Um, you know, we've been talking about this, I think now this is our second board meeting. And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes and so there's things that we may not get. But I, I haven't heard anything yet from any other, other than Kappa who has, real, I appreciate Jeremy's presentation, but from any other stakeholders regarding this issue, should I interpret that as no news is good news? I would not. <laughs> Um, and there's a possibility that you're not hearing anything because this is all just speculation conversation. Gotcha. Until gotcha. there is a bill introduced, most associations will not comment um, on anything going forward. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank you so much. And I love the fact that we're able to speak uh, about these issues yeah. and these concerns. And this is the forum to bring those up. If I could. So, uh, um, as Melissa stated, you never 
never know where your opposition is going to come from yep. in, in, in the legislature. So it's easy to envision a particular senator or assemblyman who is closely aligned with an uh, opposing force coming in and throwing a bomb into the legislation. And the risk you have here is, is my opinion last time, is you had legislative intent when they said one to four, way back when the statute was done. I think it was in 2022, there was an attempt to amend it. They said no. If you put it in again and it is shot down, you will now have three times where they said no. Trying to overturn that intent later is going to be virtually impossible politically. Three so times, three times the charm. I just say three times the charm. Um, I, um, you know, and I'm just being facetious here. I, I appreciate everything you just said, uh, Board Mentor. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I still would like to continue with my motion. And um, um, before we do that, I just want to make a comment. Um, I want to make it known that we, our jobs, uh, anticipate opposition. Um, I don't think that that is an issue. Uh, I think what we do uh, when we bring up topics of concern, we are going to have people who are for um, certain issues and then oppose those issues. So I don't think that um, opposition or could face or whatever it is, I think we need to do our um, best to bring up the concerns of the California consumers um, and that is our job. Um, and then we let it rest for the legislature to do whatever they need to do. Um, Ma Madam President, point yes. of order. So we went to public comment on the motion. Yes. And it seems like we've now returned to board member discussion. Okay. Do you want that to continue? Um, if we do, then I think we need to open it back up for public comment because we're, we're having oh, more discussion. Okay, the great. I think we have ended public comment, and so we will move on. I think we have a motion on the floor. Um, is that correct? We go to the... That's correct. We need to vote on the motion. Could somebody please Which, reiterate the, the motion? motion? <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you, Michael. The motion, if I may, yeah, um, that the motion was that we not include any language that specifies any ratios in our sunset review materials. Can you repeat that, we, that, that again? Not, Can you yeah, that, that we not include in our sunset materials any language that specifies any ratio. Meaning raise it as a concern or not put in a numeric number? I think not, my, my motion was specific, not, not include any numbers. But it can still be included in as a new issue. I think that's a separate motion. My motion is solely that our sunset review not include any specificity of numbers. Gotcha. Okay. I'll second. I'll second, okay. Um, and we like to uh, Ms. LaFort, we'd like to call the roll for a vote. Charles Alexander? Uh, aye. Juan Amenta? Aye. Sonia Hurd? Aye. 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 Excellent. Um, now, do we have a new uh, recommendation? Yes, so I would recommend that we um, raise the physician, uh, the supervising physician to PA ratio um, in, as a new issue in the sunset report. Um, and as the previous motion mentioned, we're not specifying a number, but to raise it as a concern of the one to four ratio in the sunset review as a new issue. And is that to include all the other things that Mr. Mr. Uh, Diego, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that would be looking at the distribution of PAs across the state. Um, and so um, I think uh, the other issue was the access to care, right? And so as we're looking at it in the context, is to include it in as a new issue under the umbrella of access to care and whether or not the ratio is sufficient. And, and I'll put in a little bit more, whether or not the ratio, the one to four ratio is sufficient um, to improve access to care to California patients through the utilization of physician assistance by physicians. That's the motion. Uh, point of order, if we're gonna have a motion that's that long with that much detail in it, I think we're gonna need a written motion. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it, I'll shorten um, it. Okay. I'll shorten it. 
Um, so the motion would be um, to review the one to four supervising physician to physician assistant ratio. Is there? Uh, once again, I think I think what you're saying is to raise as a new issue. Raise the issue as a new issue. Correct. That is correct. Without without a without spec mentioning specific numbers. Or correct. Correct. Okay. That, that's the motion. Is that is the motion. Is there a second? I didn't understand the motion. <laughs> okay. Can you repeat the motion again? It's so it's just raising it as a concern, raising the physician. Uh, the, the, the supervising physician to PA ratio as a concern, um, as a new issue within the Sunset Report. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I second. Um, Ms. LaFort, would you like to call? Well, we need comment. We need comment. member discussion and okay. public comment. Okay, member discussion, additional discussion? Um, yeah, I'll go back to. Yeah, for the, for the reasons, you wanna go ahead, Charles? No, no I'm just gonna. Uh, I mean, I think it was clear that we're not mentioning ratios, and I think right. that's what the previous motion. Yeah. Well, we're not. No, it's the numeric limit. We're not putting a numeric. We're mentioning ratios, but not a numeric limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. And I think too, I'm going back to what um, Rosanna said about if we raise new issues and concerns, we have to have some solutions, mm -hmm. right? Language. And so we're looking at providing maybe examples of what we mean mm -hmm. in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, addressing the issue. Mm -hmm. Is correct. that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Okay. So, okay. I just want to make, yeah. okay. make that clear. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. yeah. And, and Dr. Alexander points out the difficulty, mm -hmm. right? Our materials would have to say that statute, do something with it, and that jumps into the area of policy. I think a better way to do this is let the proponents, COPPA, whoever it is, if, if somebody wants to go lobby their own, their own assemblyman or senator, let them propose the bill and we comment when it comes back to us. Uh, I think that's, that's the better way uh, to do this. So uh, I intend to vote, once we're done, I intend to vote no on that motion. Okay, is there any other um, yeah, board just, member comment? I'll just say one more, uh, just one more time, and I know I've been kind of reverberating this, so forgive me and being a little bit redundant, maybe taking a little bit more time than we should. But I think this is a very important time. When we look at our primary care access issues, we have a one to four ratio that is 16 years old. 16 years old. We have an opportunity to raise it as a concern to the legislature. It's one thing if this ratio had been done four years ago, then one would say, well, why raise it now? It was just done four years ago. But with the crippling primary care crisis and the amount of investment the state is making in advanced practice providers to meet this need, why would we not take an opportunity to just share the concern and a couple examples? They're examples. Examples don't have to be acted upon. You can just bring about some examples. And if the legislature says no for the third time, then you won't have to hear my spiel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move on. But I am very passionate about access to care. I am passionate like each and every one of you are. As a PA, I've seen patients come to my clinic who I said, you have to go back to your primary care and get cleared. And they can't get in to see their primary care physician for three months. That is difficult for me as a provider or someone coming in with uncontrollable hypertension and I say, have you seen your primary care physician? I can't get an appointment for four months. That's a difficult thing for a healthcare provider. Don't we owe it to the California citizens to look at every opportunity, everything that we can possibly do to improve access to care? At some point, we're gonna to have to take it beyond a concern to some actionable step, whatever that may be. But certainly I would say that if we raise it as a concern, as a new issue, we provide examples, we don't say this is what we recommend, but here are a couple examples, and they say no, then it's done. But let us at least try. There's no harm in trying, in my viewpoint. And not to mention that it would be a cost savings for the state and yeah. time savings. There's no fiscal impact for this. So, so I think the difficulty lies in 
we raise it as a concern, but as Rosanna mentioned, we need to be specific about things and action plans and other things in a sunset review. So we can't be vague and say, this is a concern, you know, we suggest these things and let it kind of fly and let people run with it because we have to be concise and we want a, you know, strategic plan. And I think that is what, you know, makes it difficult for us as a board, a regulatory board, to continue to pursue. Whether we, you know, we, we all have shown that we agree that we, w we would probably support something like this happening, but in the sunset review, it seems like it's going to be something difficult to, to attain to put the specifics in there by just saying that we have, you know, these concerns because it seems like they want specifics. I mean, I think um, we have other, um, I think Rosanna did an excellent job in giving us uh, things to read about um, that she's put forth. I think it would be similar to that. We already know the, um, uh, where we can tag this to, which code section, 3504.1, and then we can move on, and then also we can give examples. And I think we can wordsmith uh, with council's help um, to do that. Um, and I think it's not as ominous, you know, as it seems, so. And then if I just may to uh, thank you, Diego, I really appreciate your um, insight on that. And so you raise a, a great question that I'm going to now ask the council and Rosanna about. And thank you, um, uh, President Early, for that. I think that you're absolutely on, on point. Are we allowed, and this is for me because I don't know, so I'm going to ask the question. I think it might be a question for everyone. Um, Rosanna and, and, and team, are we allowed to include ex potential examples in the Sunset Report of what we think may help to address the ratio? Or do we have to be dogmatic and have a level of specificity? Can we include examples of these are some of the things that we think may help without being dogmatic or super specific? Because I don't know the answer to that. So the direction I'm getting this sunset, while well, our next 2025 sunset, is we have to be very specific. If we're asking, if we're identifying a problem, we have to uh, provide a solution. For example, like I said, I'm, I'm asking for a um, cap limit increase, and I'm saying proposed language of business and professions code section 3521.1, and I'm striking the prior you know, dollar amount and putting in my new dollar amount. So just letting you know what the directions are, you have to be very specific. What code sections are you trying to amend? The problem you have identified, what solution are you providing? And then that's when the legislature will review it and may consider it. Okay, and then my second, thank you for world, and that's extremely helpful. So the second uh, question I have is, um, on the um, opportunity of raising it as a concern, um, is there a possibility of raising it as a concern as a new issue? Or do ev does every single new issue have to have specificity attached to it? Are we allowed to raise it as a concern? And that's important for us to know, right? Because if we're saying that we have to have a level of specificity, then they were limited to what we can do. But then can we raise it as a concern? So can we say with specificity that we have concerns about the one to four ratio in meeting access to care? Well, I mean, I, I so, so really this is a matter of the committee's procedure in terms of their form and their sunset report requirements mm -hmm. of what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is why I'm asking the question, Mike. So if right. so, I, so I don't I don't have that committed to to, to, to memory, and I think, um, but I take Rosanna uh, Rosanna at her word in terms of them saying that they want um, specifics in terms of what is the solution and what is you know down to what is the code language that you want to change. No, no, no. That so, no. So based on that, I don't see an avenue for. <coughs> bringing it up as a new issue without doing that because that's the instructions that right. that the executive officer. Okay. And so just to, just to make sure that I'm I fully understand, so we can't really raise it as a new concern without providing substan really specificity to what we want to do about that concern. Yeah. Is that is that is that kind of what I'm hearing? That is correct. I, I think that's right. And let me, let me but is that correct? I just I just want to make sure. So Rosanna and Mike, I want to make sure that because you know here we are in a public meeting here. I want to make absolutely sure that if we were to raise it as a concern, that the one to four ratio may not meet the goal of improving access to care. 
and we raise it as a concern, we can't just leave it at that. I just want to be very clear because I'm a little concerned that, okay, yes, we need some specificity. I would, I would agree, and that's something that the legislature may be able to provide. But m m my concern is, are we not allowed to even raise it as a concern, as a new right. issue in the Sunset Report? And that, is right. that what I'm hearing? That. What I understand is we will have to provide language. What code section are we amending? We will have, the staffer will contact us, will contact staff, will ask us which BNP code section is being amended. So that's when we will point to 3516, right? Is that the mm -hmm. ratio? Yep. Mm -hmm. So right. could we point to that as a concern? Could we right. say, could we say that 3516B, we are concerned on whether or not uh, the one to four ratio actually improves access to care without providing specificity on the numeric limit? That's what they're going to ask us. What are we proposing? What change or what yeah. number are we proposing to increase it to, to re resolve this issue? Could we provide them then examples for that? Well, no. they're, they're well, asking us for, I think they're asking us for the specific. Okay. Of what yeah. we want. But they they the want us to take a position. This, this process is normally not meant to involve um, overarching policy changes or practice changes. It's designed to be sort of we want to raise the number of continuing education hours from 20 to 25. Yeah. Or we want to raise a fee. Or we have, you know, these education issues where the degree has changed and we have to. So it's really the, the, the areas that are within the jurisdiction of the board as it carries out its, its duties in licensing um, PAs and enforcing the act. Okay. So Michael, you, would we, then would we have to give a suggestion to brace you? Is that what you're saying? If we bring that up? Well, well again, these are the, these are the committee's I'm instructions on your sunset report. Yeah. That's but, what he's saying. It sounds pretty yeah. clear. Like, like, like we have to we have to be specific down to the words of the statute we want to be changed. Okay. It's kind of complicated. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, if, we, that's, if uh, I may, that's that's why this is policy <laughs> that we don't do. Um, I would also point out that this is not 16 years old. It isn't. 1070. Its original bill increased it to eight. That was the original bill that was proposed by Assemblyman Lowe to increase it to eight, specifically. It is 16 years old, and it, it no, is 16 no. years. P permit me, yeah. it is not. It is. It, it, it is, maybe the origin is 16, but it is not <laughs> 16 years old for legislative interpretive purposes. You had a bill introduced by Assemblyman Lowe, 1070, in 23, which says, his language was, also authorize a physician and surgeon to supervise up to eight physicians at one time. The legislature said no. So it is not 16 years old. It is one year old. So the, the, the expression of their intent is one year old. So I'm going to uh, agree to disagree with uh, Board Member Armenta. It is 16 years old, and what he's referencing applies to people, uh, PAs, who do not prescribe and do not provide direct patient care. So there was an increase from one to eight, but it does not impact prescribers. The one to four ratio, which occurred from Assembly Bill, two, uh, Assembly Bill 3 was passed in 2008. So that means that it is 16 years old, that we absolutely have a one to four ratio that impacts prescribers. My presentation was focused on those who are prescribing and providing direct patient care. The one to four ratio applies to those providers. And as a friendly reminder, according to the NCCPA, 95% of certified clinically practicing PAs prescribe medication. So when we increase the ratio for those who do not prescribe and those who do not provide direct patient care, we're not having a substantial impact. So the one to four numeric limit for prescribers is 16 years old. Okay, well, that's a nuanced discussion. So you're right, it related to home health evaluations yep. to gather patient information and people who do not prescribe. Ooh, that is that's, a sm that's a small subset, right? Yeah. Correct. And that, that allows for less mischief, less misadventure, less negligence. There's that's no... Su that small subset, right? The less danger in those physicians, right? They're not doing surgeries, they're not prescribing medications. It's a very small subset. And the legislature even said no to that. That is a big signal. 
to me on policy. Well, I don't think the legislature actually said no to that because we, we passed, passed AB 10. We actually passed AB 1070. And so the one to eight is actually in play if you're doing home health assessments, provided that you're, you're, you're not prescribing or providing direct patient care. So the one to eight was actually passed. And it's actually on the medical board's website. Right. Um, what, what, what we didn't see was the one to eight um, being transplanted onto prescribers, right? People who are prescribing and providing uh, direct patient care. So just, to, just for a correction for the record, AB 1070 did pass. It is a one to eight ratio, but only for those who are not prescribing or providing direct patient care. And that, and that bill did not come from us. It came from the proper legislative process. Which is, this is why we're in this difficulty. We're trying to mix policy and process, and I think that's incorrect. Any other board comment? Do we have public comment? Okay, Ms. LaForte, I think we can call the roll for a vote. I'm sorry, could we, so the restate the motion is to what? I think the, uh, the, the motion is to raise the physician, supervising physician assistant to PA ratio one to four, uh, business professions code 3516B as a concern on whether or not it increases access to care. Okay, so a, a yes vote, then that would mean that we would include this in, in the Sunson okay. report. Got it. Without a numeric specified limit. One, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Alex. Oh, with the one to four, yes. So, so then there is some specificity there. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be specific. There, there, there is some specificity there, right? Because I am mentioning one to four. Right so I would like to, uh, so, so, so the motion again is to raise, um, uh, you know, to raise this as a concern, as a new issue, uh, Business and Professions Code 3516B, I think it is. Is that correct? Correct. The, the supervising physician one to four ratio as a concern on whether or not it improves access to care. So, so the motion I heard, the motion I heard um, when the motion was made was to raise, was to raise the position to PA uh, ratio issue in the sunset report, but not provide any numbers or solutions to that. So what I'm saying is to raise it as a concern, and so um, according to, I think, what you had mentioned and what Rosanna had mentioned is we needed to provide a little bit of specificity. So my specificity is to look at code section 3516B, the one to four supervising physician to PA ratio and, and whether or not it improves access to care. I get that, but that wasn't in the motion that was made second. That's, well, that's the new motion. You, you can't make any motion at this time. You can move to amend your I move to amend my motion. Okay, is there a second for the amendment to the motion? I second. So now we have to vote on the amendment to the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you for keeping us on point. Um, <laughs> so the moment, so the, the addition to the motion is, can you, can you state that again? Yes, to include this as a new issue in the Sunset Report, specifically Business and Professions Code 3516B, which is the physician, supervising physician to PA ratio of one to four on whether or not that ratio increases access to care. Okay, so the addition is raising it and, and mentioning w about whether it improves access to care. Correct, raising it as a concern. Okay. Which I think we all agree with, we're concerned by it. So just in terms of process, we're amending a motion. So we need to take, if there's any more comment on the motion, we need to do board comment, public comment. We need to vote on the amendment. Okay. If the amendment passes and the original motion is amended and we go back and we vote on the original motion again, that we're, we're in procedure here. Okay. Wouldn't it be simple if we just simple if we just voted on the first motion and to make a new motion? Uh, it's too late now. We've had a motion. <laughs> <laughs> In light of this conversation, I think we're all going to need to have a, a nice lunch. We'll go to a break after this. So, so I suggest that we. I think. I think we're done. Uh, think, can any we move to public comment? On any the public comment? Yeah. On the amendment? Okay. No public comment on the amendment. 
Okay, so now we, we, are, we are voting on the amendment to the motion to include the additional statements about um, access to care in the original motion, to add those statements to the original motion. Okay, um, Charles Alexander? So this is not a vote on the original, this is not a vote on the original motion we were discussing, it's a vote to amend that motion to add that piece, and then we'll go back and vote on the whole thing. It's always a challenge to be A. <laughs> <laughs> All my life, you know. <laughs> Come on, John. <laughs> you know, um, I'll say I for now. Yeah. Because huh? uh, I, I'll I want to go back to the original motion, but I for this. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the original motion too, so I. And Juan Armenta, it's I. I. Sonia Early? I. Diego and Zunza? I. Vasco Dion Kidd? Aye. And Sonia, uh, De sorry, Deborah Snow? <laughs> Aye. <laughs> okay, and the amendment to that motion uh, passes. Now we would go back. So, so now I think, um, I don't know that we need any more member comment, but we're back, we're back now to an amended motion. Okay. So we need member comment, public comment, and then vote on the main motion that okay. has amended. Okay. Member comment, public comment. Okay. And so now. Call the roll. Call the roll. Call the roll. Can we restate the whole motion? Yeah. So I think the motion with the amendment is to raise the issue of the ratio in the sunset report and to do that in light of the access to care issue. Correct. So that can be reflected yeah. in the minutes. Absolutely. Okay. As a concern. As a concern. As a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Charles Alexander? Aye. <clears throat> Juan Armenta? No. Sonia Early? Aye. Diego and Sunza? Nay. I'm sorry, what was that? No. Um, Vasco Dion Kidd? Aye. And Deborah Snow? Oh, I'm so <laughs> ambivalent about this. Um, and I can't say yes and no. Um, no. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, we have a tie vote. It's 3 3, so it so does not. Fails. Motion fails. No. Yes. All right. And so. I think we've done with that. Well, we're done now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, thank you That's for okay. that That's robust awesome. conversation. So cool. um, yeah. I think we need a break at this point in time. <laughs> yes. So we'll take a 15-minute we'll break. We'll do it. <laughs>
Um, this report reflects the fourth quarter, which is of April 1st, 2024 through June 30th of 2024. During this period, the board received 497 initial applications for licensures and issued, I mean, yes, and issued 420 initial PA licenses received two applications for a temporary military spouse license and three temporary military licenses. We approved 2,090 license renewal applications. So the next one is the um, pending application workload. Um, at this time, the board staff had a pending application workload totaling 379 initial applications for licensure. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I just have one question. Um, it seems that we're on par. Um, we normally have just about under 1,000 um, new initial licenses, and we are at just at about 500. So um, is that normal, or is that a decrease or increase? Um, I'm sorry. I would have to. For uh, those initial licenses. Yeah, I'll, I have to speak with Mrs. Caldwell. I can oh, ask that's her. Right. Okay. All right, I think we're on par. I think that's about normal. I think we normally have just under 1,000 new, um, uh, uh, new applications, so I think that's on par, so thank you. If I understand this correctly, your completed apps, you're under your target time, you're hitting it. Correct. Okay, great, thank you. Excellent. All right. I'll move on to the discipline, um, to the discipline um, statistics report. So for the fourth quarter, it's uh, July 1st of 2024 to June 30th of 2024. There were no suspensions during the fiscal year and, uh, for the Office of the Attorney General. For cases initiated in the fourth quarter, there were four. But the total year to date is 28, which is down percentage from last fiscal year. Cases pending. Seven C, right? Seven C. Seven C. Sorry. So the case is pending. Um, the Attorney General Office is uh, 44 for the quarter, and year to date is 44. Uh, it's a rise in 2% from last fiscal year. And the average agent of pending cases for the fourth quarter is 466, and year to date is 456, which is a rise from last fiscal year. <coughs> Uh, the next section is the formal actions filed, withdrawn, and dismissed. Um, there were no accusations filed in the fourth quarter. But the year to date for the whole fiscal year was 22, which was up 10% from last year. Um, for accusation and, and or petition to revoke probation filed, there were two in the quarter. Uh, for the total fiscal year, there were two. And for the accusation withdrawn and dismissed during the fourth quarter, there were none. Um, 
um, for the total fiscal year, there were three. Uh, there were three licensees placed on probation this quarter, and the total for the fiscal year is eight. For the public approval, there were two issued in the fourth quarter, and the total for this fiscal year is two. Revocation, there were none for this uh, quarter, and for the total fiscal year, there was two. The surrender of licenses, uh, there was one this quarter, and a total of five this year. And for the petition for termination of probation that was granted, <coughs> None for the quarter of uh, the fiscal year, there was one. And for the petition for termination of probation, I was denied. Um, none this quarter, but for the fiscal year, there was one. And so I'll move on to the citation and fine. During the fourth quarter, there were 30 citations issued. The total for the fiscal year is 46, which is significant for last fiscal year. Um, Citation was drawn, there was one drawn in the fourth quarter, and for the fiscal year, there was just one. <clears throat> for the citation solved, resolved and closed, there were nine for the uh, fourth quarter, and for the total fiscal year, there were 12. For citations pending, there's 21 for the fourth quarter, with the total for the fiscal year of 34. Uh, fines issued for this quarter, there was $8,500 uh, for the total fiscal year, it's $12,750. The fine withdrawn, there was $250, and for the fiscal year, it was $250. Uh, fines received for the fourth quarter. Yes. Okay. Oops. Okay. So for the uh, fines received, for this quarter, it was uh, $2,500, and for the year to date, it was uh, $3,250, which was down from last fiscal year. So this concludes that report. Does anybody have any questions? No? Mm -hmm. So the delta between fines issued and received, I imagine that's because they're being paid over time? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. Okay, you can continue with probation. Yes. So I'll be presenting the probation activity report for Mr. Ard. So for um, for this quarter, the fourth quarter, <clears throat> uh, four probationers entered probation. Um, there are thirty-five active probationers. There were eight told. And the total pro probationers are 43. Okay, does anyone have any questions? What does total mean? What's the practical? So toll is uh, not practicing for 30 days or more um, if they're out of state and not serving probation in another state. Excellent. Any other questions? OK, OK. Diversion. I'll move into the diversion program activity report. For the fourth quarter, there was one self-referral. Um, and there was one um, who completed Maximus. The total of active participants are five. That concludes my report. Does anyone have any okay. questions? No. Any questions for Ms. LaFort? No. Thank, Thank you, Ms. LaFort. Thank you. All right. We'll move back to mm -hmm. complaints. That's item number 7B by Mr. Melendez. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be providing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be providing you a section of the enforcement activity re report in regards to the complaints for the fourth quarter. We will be focusing on the fourth quarter of April 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2024. As you can see, uh, we have also provided stats from the previous year. This report will <clears throat> will also show how we are trending this fiscal year to last fiscal year. I'll start off with uh, complaint volume. We have received uh, 167 complaints for the quarter. We have received um, uh, one convi uh, conviction or arrest case um, with a total of 168 cases. Intake, 
The intake average is at seven days. We have zero complaints that are pending at, at, at the intake. Complaints and investigations. 17 complaints were referred for investigation. 113 complaints and investigations were closed. 337 complaints are pending at the, de at the desk, uh, at the analyst desk. 42 cases, <coughs> excuse me, 42 case, case investigations are pending at the field. Investigation aging. The average age of pending investigations are at 274 days. Investigations over eight months old, there are 21 cases. I would like to move to the following chart. The following chart is on the co complaints received by type and source. This concludes my portion of the report. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Do we have any questions for Mr. Melendez? I, I do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Comment and question. Thank you. Um, so uh, I see a significant drop in aging, which is great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's, that's a good job. Um, what are, do you think are the complaints? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What, uh, so congratulations on and thank you for getting those numbers down on the on the investigations aging. What do you think um, are the primary reasons that that is going down? Um, I would say um, the, the field uh, offices bo uh, moved on some of the cases uh, uh, sooner. The, the, it, it might be a different case that they could move sooner on um, or complete faster than, than previous cases. Uh, that can bring it down. Um, there might have been also, um, uh, it, it just depends on the case type that, that will cause, like a quality of care case can take uh, uh, more time to complete than something of, of an arrest or, or so, and th those, those can alter the, the time frames on the case, on case reviews of okay. the field. All right. Is there any, any uh, change in, in your protocols or systems that, that is driving this down, or do you think it's more the nature of the cases themselves? Well, um, it's more the nature of the cases, but uh, we're hoping that having a, a special investigator in-house um, can can reduce also by just completing the case uh, the cases in-house. Um, uh, there's um, there's some cases that can be closed uh, uh, sooner having the cases uh, reviewed in, uh, in-house at at the headquarters office. Okay. I do want to add that, um, Mr. Melendez. He does get documents for um, convictions, um, gathers all those um, documents before cases do go out to the field. He did implement that, so that kind of, um, you know, shaves off that timeline okay. as well. Okay, great. Don't forget to pat yourself on the back. Don't <laughs> give any opportunity. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melendez, and it, we do uh, appreciate you and um, helping us to decrease that time uh, and the volume. Thank uh, you. Is there any public comments? Yeah, to the contrary, I'm, <clears throat> I'm looking at complaints received. Um, I noticed it jumped up, 167 from 114 the previous quarter. Yes. Any yes, comments it, about that? Uh, no, that, that I, I couldn't uh, <laughs> tell you why it increased uh, just that much in this quarter, this last quarter. Mm -hmm. um, but the cases have increased from uh, last fiscal year to this fiscal year. Um, mm -hmm. uh, last fiscal year, I, I believe we were pretty close to 500. Now we're over 500. Um, um, so uh, that I, I, I can't really answer on why okay. we got so many this last quarter. Maybe it's post-pandemic numbers or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People feeling healthy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> healthy enough to complain. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Great job. Uh, thank you. All right. Any other comments from the board? Excellent. Any public comment? Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Melendez thank and Ms. Laforte. Um, now we'll move on to um, item number eight, Department of Consumer Affairs, Director Support.
Hello and good morning again, President Early, Vice President Kidd, Executive Officer Khan, and members of the board. I'm Melissa Gear, Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations, and I appreciate the opportunity to share the Department of Consumer Affairs update this morning. Before I get started, I'd like to take a moment to welcome Dr. Sai in his absence to the board and appreciate his commitment to serving and protecting California's consumers. In addition, I want to thank Dr. Hawkins also in his absence for his service and commitment for protecting California's consumers as well. Um, we will miss his insightful um, updates and comments. Now I will begin my update and reminders. First, I will begin with an update on budget letter 2420 regarding vacancy savings and position elimination. The Department of Finance, or DOF, has issued budget letter 2420 implementing the governor's proposal to reduce the state workforce by 10,000 positions and $1.5 billion. DCA's budget office is working closely with each board and bureau to identify appropriate reductions while maintaining the mandate for consumer protection. The final budget reduction plan will need to be approved by agency and ultimately the Department of Finance. The budget reduction will be effective starting in 24-25 and ongoing, while the position elimination will be effective starting in 25-26 and ongoing. The reductions will impact DCA boards and bureaus. DCA will share further information and guidance from the Department of Finance as it becomes available. Next is a Governor's Appointments Office update. Deputy Appointment Secretary Miri Valdez Singh was appointed Deputy Commissioner of Legislation at the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. She worked closely with the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, DCA, boards and bureaus on board and advisory committee appointments. Her last day with the appointments unit was July 5th. Going forward, Deputy Appointment Secretary Curtis Lang will oversee the Healing Arts Board, and Assistant Deputy Appointment Secretary Aubrey Anthony will oversee the Non-Healing Arts Board. Boards and bureaus should continue working with board and bureau relations on their appointment needs. We wish Miri well in her new role and look forward to working with Curtis and Aubrey. I'd also like to remind you about the updated workplace violence prevention policy and new training requirement. SB 553 is a new law that became effective in January. SB 553 amended the California Labor Code to require California employers to develop and implement a workplace violence prevention plan and train all employees by July 1st, 2024. As a result of this new law, DCA updated its current workplace violence prevention policy to include all requirements of SB 553. DCA has also developed an annual workplace violence prevention training that is located on DCA's learning management system. The training is mandatory for all DCA employees, including board members. This new training must be completed by August 30th, 2024. If you have any questions or need assistance accessing LMS, please contact Board and Bureau Relations. And I would also note that many of you through your employers may also be taking a similar training. Um, unfortunately, um, that training that you're doing with your employer will not be able to be accepted here at DCA because our training is specific, so it's specific training for each employer. So I apologize in advance that you will need to do it twice. <laughs> Likewise, I want to remind you about board member orientation training, or BMOT. Board members must complete board member orientation <laughs> training, also known as BMOT, within one year of appointment or reappointment. Our October 22nd, 2024 BMOT will be offered virtually, and this will be the last training of this year. You may register via LMS. Next up is an update on the licensing resources webinar for military service members and their families. On July 31st, DCA participated in a virtual military licensing web webinar hosted by Navy Region Southwest. The webinar showcased DCA military licensing resources to active duty military veterans and military spouses throughout California and Nevada Navy bases. DCA's Deputy Director of Communications provided an overview of licensing resources, and DCA's Deputy Director of Information Services provided a demonstration of the Federal Professional License Portability and State Registration Online Portal. 
DCA received positive feedback and looks forward to continuing its partnership with the military community. I'd also like to share an, a DEI update. DCA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI Steering Committee, met on July 26th. The meeting included discussion on DEI training, development of a workforce development survey from a DEI perspective, expanding language access, and DEI activities for inclusion in the DCA annual report. This is the second year the DEI committee is memorializing the department's DEI activities in the annual report, which is provided to the administration and the legislature. This year's report will include DCA specific updates on training, outreach, language access, and tools and resources created for staff. And it will also highlight board and bureau accomplishments. I'm pleased to share a few examples of DEI related activities completed by the boards. To further expand public input and access, the Acupuncture Board released its strategic planning survey in four languages, English, Spanish, Chinese, and Korean. 75% of the surveys were completed in a language other than English. The California State Athletic Commission extended an existing agreement and executed two new agreements with tribal nations to regulate combat sports on tribal land and ensure, participa to ensure participant safety. The Medical Board of California administers the Mexico pilot program, which allows up to 30 physicians licensed in Mexico who specialize in family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, and obstetrics and gynecology to practice in California for up to three years. In 2023, nine additional physicians were licensed under the Mexico pilot program, reaching the 30 physician threshold. The Contractor State License Board translated 10 examinations commonly taken by candidates in Spanish including the law and business examination that are required of all applicants. For all other, for all other trade examinations and languages, accommodations are made for applicants to be joined by an approved translator during the examination. The annual report will be available early next year and will be shared with your executive officer. The next DEI committee meeting is on October 25th. If you have ideas you'd like the committee to consider, please share them with your executive officer. In addition, I want to share a phishing alert. As a reminder, boards are urged to continue to be vigilant and cautious of potential phishing attempts and deceptive <coughs> emails, texts, and calls to trick individuals into revealing sensitive information or installing malicious software. If you suspect any phishing attempt or encounter a suspicious email, please report it immediately to your executive officer our DCA's Office of Information Security. This helps us to take swift action to protect everyone. Lastly, as I close, again, thank you for this opportunity to join you today. I'm happy to answer any questions from the board. And if further information or assistance is needed with any of the items shared today, please don't hesitate to reach out to Board and Bureau Relations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gear. Do we have any questions from the board? I just comment that was an excellent report. Thank you, Ms. Gear. Any public comment? All right, thank you again for that excellent report. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, let's move on to item number nine, um, budget update. <coughs> am I providing the budget update? Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right, I'll be providing the uh, budget update. Um, so I'm here to present the 23-24 fiscal month 11 projection memo, expenditure and fund condition. Please refer to agenda item number nine. We are going to start with the budget memo. This will give you a general overview of the board's budget, as well as a percentage of the budget used and counted toward expenditure. In 2023-24, the board has a budget of $3,325,000. The board is projected to use 37.5% of its expenditure on personal services, not personnel services, but personal services, which includes salary and benefits, 36% uh, for operating expense and equipment, which includes contracts, purchases, and travel. Finally, 25.9% for enforcement, which is for the Office of Administrative Hearings and Attorney General. The board is estimated to have 0.62% in reversion. On the second page, uh, we have the fund condition. We have the prior year 23-24 first column, which has a fiscal month 11 projections included into it. To note, we have not closed the 23-24, um, and that is why we still have it as projected. 
um, 23, 24 year beginning balance of about 4.2 million. We have an estimated revenue of about 2.95 million and an estimated total expenditure of about 3.4 million. That gives us a fund balance of 3.79 million, which is about 13.2 months in reserve. Budget year is based on the governor's budget and budget year plus one based on realized. We have no immediate concern for this fund. Current year 24-25 second column, which is based on the governor's budget 24-25 beginning balance of, three, uh, of about 3.79 million, which we have an estimated revenue of about 3 million. An estimated total expenditure of about 3.4 million that gives us a fund balance of 3.4 million, which is about 11 and a half months in reserve. Budget year is based on the governor's budget and budget year plus one is based on realized. We have no immediate concerns for this fund. Next document we have is fiscal month 11, 23-24 projected expenditure. We have $1.2 million in personal services or personnel services, I should say, and about $2.1 million in operating expense and equipment expenses for the total of about $3.3 million, which created a surplus of about 21,000 or a little under 1%. We are monitoring the fund and have no immediate concerns. This will end my report. Thank you, Vice President Kidd. Are there any questions from the board? And I just want to make a note, it's personal services um, in that report, so perfect. Are there any public comment? I think I said personal services okay. in the report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, if not, we'll move on to item number 10. We have an update on the 2025 sunset review process and draft report by Ms. Khan. During the May 20, 2024 board meeting, an overview of the sunset <coughs> review process was presented along with an estimated timeline. The final report is due to the legislature by January 6, 2025. On July 23, 2024, Policy Committee legislative staff met with board staff to provide valuable insight and feedback <laughs> on the sunset process. The August draft, which is the attachment one, may include some of the responses from the 2020, 2020 sunset review report as the questions and responses remain unchanged. This draft also includes summaries of issues raised by the Joint Oversight Committee and recommendations as well as opportunity for the board to identify new issues. Over the next several months, board staff will continue to expand and update the responses, providing revised drafts for the board's review and input. No specific board action is requested at this time. However, please review the draft responses provided <coughs> thus far and provide feedback at this meeting. Your feedback during the discussion will be invaluable as we finalize our responses and prepare for the next steps in the review process. Uh, I would like to point out, I, I hope everybody had a chance to review this. Uh, this for the booklet, it's page 109. And uh, uh, the uh, PDF version is, uh, let me. Mm -hmm. Is it 60? Yeah, so that, uh, for the book, it's 109, uh, 109, and then for the PDF, it's, oh, it's, is it the same? No. Yeah, it is the same. Um, one, so 100, uh, 109, uh, you can see the issue that I identified is the initial license fee increase and proposed statutory cap adjustment, which still has to be reviewed by board council. Uh, still draft form, uh, I give a, a background regarding our um, initial license fee, which our cap is right now 250, but we are charging 200. And instead of doing a regulatory <coughs> package, which you guys all know it takes a long time, we're proposing to increase that now to 250 and then raise the statutory cap um, to 600 from 250. And for the application fee from $25 to $60. We did do a fee study back in 2020, but it was not the right climate to ask for fee increases uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, but this is something that we're putting into our um, sunset as a new issue. And then you'll see the proposed language uh, to amend business and professions code section 3521.1, which still has to be reviewed by council. Um, before we finalize the package and uh, present it for approval in November. 
with that, um, if there's any other. And I think those, um, thank you, Rosanna, that's mm -hmm. uh, absolutely uh, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, is it the board to understand that those fee increases will be phased in over time if approved? That is correct. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? Any public comment? Excellent. Thank you again for that wonderful report, Ms. Khan. Uh, moving on to item number 11, regulations, um, update on pending regulatory package by Ms. Dillon. And I will have Ms. Dillon go on to do item number 14, and then we'll come back to the educational workforce development. All right, good morning. Um, so the first package um, I will be providing an update on is SB 697, License Renewal and Continuing Medical Education Required. Staff is currently working on initial documents with Regulations Council and the Budget Office to submit for initial review. The next package, SB 697 Implementation, at the May 20, 2024 board meeting, the board rejected the comments received and adopted the staff recommended responses to the comments received. The final documents were submitted to the Office of Administrative Law for final review on June 6, 2024 and the package was filed with the Secretary of State on July 19, 2024, and will become effective on October 1 of 2024. The next package is SB 697 application, exam scores, addresses, and record keeping. At the November 6, 2023 meeting, the board approved the proposed regulatory language to reinitiate the rulemaking process and staff received approval from DCA Legal and is currently compiling the initial documents to send to DCA for the director's review. The next package titled Retired Status to Include Fingerprint Requirement. Staff is currently working on initial documents to submit for initial review this calendar year. And finally, implement uniform standards related to substance abusing licensees and update of disciplinary guidelines. Staff is currently working on the proposed language for board approval in the next few months. And that concludes my update. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Are there any questions from the board? Public comment? Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And I will have you move on to item number 14, which is report by the legislative specialist, um, Ms. Dillon. The first uh, bill, item A, is AB 2194, Physician Assistant Supervision Doctors of Podiatric Medicine. And this bill um, would have revised the Physician Ass Assistant Supervision provisions to authorize a physician assistant performing medical services under the supervision of a physician and surgeon to assist a doctor of podiatric medicine who was on the staff of the same organized healthcare system or who is a partner, shareholder, or employee in the same partnership, group, or professional corporation as a supervising physician and surgeon pursuant to the practice agreement. Um, this bill is currently dead as of July 2nd, 2024. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, I missed that. Oh, the bill is dead as of July 2nd, 2024. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, is that, do you wanna go on to B? And item number B is AB 2270, Healing Arts Continuing Education, Menopausal Mental or Physical Health. Um, this bill would require um, our board in determining um, continuing education requirements to consider including a course in menopausal health, mental or physical health. And at the May 20th, 2024 meeting, the board took an opposed position on this bill. Excellent. We will hold with that. Any questions or comments? All right, let's move on to C. Item number C is AB 2442, Healing Arts Expedited Licensure Process, Gender Affirming Health Care and Gender Affirming Mental Health Care. And this bill would require our board to expedite the licensure process for an applicant who demonstrates that they intend to provide gender affirming health care and gender affirming mental health, health care as defined within the scope of practice of their license and would specify the manner in which the applicant would be required to demonstrate their intent. 
Um, at the May 20th, 2024 meeting, the board took an opposed position on this bill. Okay, did um, we want to make any changes or have any comments or questions? Okay, we will continue. Item number D is AB 2581, Healing Arts, Continuing Education, Maternal Mental Health. This bill would require our board in determining continuing education requirements to consider a course in maternal mental health. And at um, the previous meeting, May 20th, 2024, the board took an opposed position on this bill. Correct. I, do we have any reasons to change that or are we gonna continue? I think we'll continue. Thank you. Okay. And item number E is AB 2862, Department of Consumer Affairs, African American Applicants. And this bill would have required um, specific boards to prioritize African American applicants seeking licenses, um, especially applicants who are descended from a person enslaved in the United States. However, this bill is dead as of July 2nd, 2024. Excellent, okay, move on. Item number F, AB 3119, Physician Surgeons, Nurse Practitioners, and Physician Assistants, Continuing Medical Education, Infection-Associated Chronic Conditions. This bill would require our board to consider in our continuing education requirements uh, for licensees specified um, above, excuse me, a course in infection-associated chronic conditions, including, and it says post-COVID conditions, but the bill was recently amended um, to state including long COVID and staff does not anticipate any fiscal impact. Okay, and so um, are there any comments from the board? Did we take a previous position or is this a new? I think this, this is a is new bill. New. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Could you just um, reiterate uh, that again? I, yeah. I the, thought, usually I'm pretty good about looking at all the bills, but for some reason I missed that one. Yeah, no worries. Uh, this <clears throat> bill would just require our board to consider in our continuing education, re continuing education requirements, excuse me, um, to include a course in infection associated chronic conditions, including long COVID. Yeah, so currently uh, PAs uh, as well as nurse practitioners have an option of doing CME, a variety of CME on their own to fulfill their requirements. So. Uh, you know, it's at their discretion on what types of CMEs that they do to fulfill their certification requirements. So I, I would recommend that we take an oppose on this bill. Are there any other questions or comments? And, and, uh, yeah, question. Again, this, this is a new bill, right? This is a new mm -hmm. bill. Okay. All right. I would have to agree. Um, we do have uh, at length which CMEs that we can choose to take. And so I think that would be covered in that. Um, for each of the practitioners. So I would take an oppose as well. Yeah, and if I could comment, Madam yes. President, I think, I think the systems in place, including our oversight, are sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the legislature needs to get into this level of meticulousness on specific training. Correct. Um, so uh, as a lay person, not a PA, uh, <laughs> that, that's my view. <laughs> <laughs> I oppose that. Uh, <laughs> I would oppose also. All right. Um, so I think if we don't have any public comment, I guess we will go for a vote. You need a motion. A motion, that's right. May so, I make the motion yes. then to oppose that we recommend opposition to this bill, AB 2862. Excellent. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Uh, Ms. LaForte, can we call the roll for a vote? I'm sorry. Public comment again. <laughs> public comment. Yeah. All right. Now let's call for a vote. <clears throat> A, B, 31. Charles Alexander? Aye. Juan Armenta? Aye. Sonia Early? Aye. Diego Insunza? Aye. Vasco Dion Kitt? Aye. Deborah Snow? Aye. All right, well, I think that is, we, motion stands approved, that's read. Um, so let's move on to item number G. Okay. Excellent. Item number G, uh, AB 3127, reporting of crimes mandated reporters. This bill was previously discussed by the board. 
Um, it would remove the requirement that a health practitioner make a report to law enforcement when they suspect a patient has suffered physical injury caused by assaultive or abusive conduct. And it would instead require that a health practitioner make a report when the injury is life-threatening or results in death as specified or is a result of child abuse or elder or dependent adult abuse. The bill would require that the health practitioner um, additionally make a report when a person is seeking care for injuries related to domestic, sexual, or any non-accidental violent injury if the patient requests a report to be sent. It would also require a health practitioner who suspects that a patient has suffered physical injury that is caused by domestic violence to provide brief counseling and a referral to local and national domestic violence or sexual violence advocacy services. A health practitioner shall not be civilly or criminally liable for any report made or not made pursuant to this section resulting in good faith compliance with this section and other applicable state and federal laws. And at the May 20th, 2024 meeting, the board took an opposed position on this bill. Okay. Um, do you guys have any updates or questions? Otherwise, I would think we would hold for the opposed. Excellent. All right. Move on to item number H. Item number H, uh, medical professionals course requirements. This bill would require a physician assistant who provides primary care to a patient population of which over 25% are 65 years of age or older to complete at least 20% of all mandatory continuing education hours in a course in the field of geriatric medicine, the special care needs of patients with dementia or the care of older patients. And staff does not anticipate any fiscal impact. And this is a new bill? Yes, this is a new okay. bill to the board. All right. Do we have any questions? Or so so it, it, it's, it's setting a compulsory requirement that they have to do this number of CMEs in these areas is what you're, is what you're yes. in geriatric medicine. Yes. So again, back to my earlier comment, I mean, we have a variety of CMEs that, uh, you know, PAs can take in order to fulfill their certification requirements and to brush up on any additional clinical content. So I would recommend that we take an oppose to this bill. I would agree. Is anybody else? Any comment? Okay. Is there a public comment? All right. Well, Ms. LaFord, I think we're ready for a vote. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> motion, please. Thank you. <laughs> I'll make a motion to oppose. All right. Is there a second? All right. Now, Ms. LaFord, we're ready for a vote. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who second the motion? I you do? Okay, thank you. Charles Alexander? Aye. Juan Armenta? Aye. Sonia Early? Aye. Diego Nsunza? Aye. Vasco Dion Kidd? Aye. Deborah Snow? Aye. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, the stands approved as read. So let's move on to item number. I, uh, SB 1041. SB 1041, uh, Physician Assistance Licensure, Armenian Medical Graduate Physician Assistance. This bill would have established the Armenian Medical Graduate Physician Assistant Training Program to be conducted at an appropriate educational institution or institutions, among other provisions. However, this bill is considered dead as of May 16th, 2024. This isn't a new bill, is that right? We no, this is no, not no. a new okay. bill. Okay, and we opposed that last time. Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right, excellent. We'll continue. Um, moving on to item number J. Item number J, SB 1067, Healing Arts Expedited Licensure Process, Medically Underserved Area or Population. This bill would require each Healing Arts Board to develop a process to expedite the licensure process by giving priority review status to the application of an applicant for a license who demonstrates that they intend to practice in a medically underserved area or serve a medically underserved population. This bill would authorize the, an applicant for licensure to de demonstrate their intent by, to practice in a medically underserved area or serve a medically underserved population by providing proper documentation, including but not limited to a letter from an employer that includes prescribed information. And at the May 20th, 2024 meeting, the board took an opposed position on this bill. Okay, and we will continue. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ms. Dillon, for that wonderful report. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Are there any questions or comments? Um, any questions or comments from the public? All right, I believe so. Thank you again, Ms. Dillon. Awesome. 
All right, moving on to item number 15. I'm sorry, we have to go back to item number 13. Uh, Education Workforce Development Advisory Committee update on physician assistant education programs and applicants in California, doctors Alexander and Kidd. Okay, thank you. The report, as you can see, uh, kind of lists the total number of PA programs in, in the nation and also uh, California accredited PA programs uh, listed as well. There's about 20. Uh, the number on probation is three. The number of provisionally accredited is five. And the developing programs, there are two. And the report also indicates geographical distribution in terms of the state, the LA San Diego area, 15, the Bay Area, four, the Sacramento Central Valley, two, and the Central Coast, one. Um, <clears throat> there's also a listing of schools with their current standing, and also the report talks about the average number of students per program. I'm going to uh, refer to my colleague on the committee as well, Dion, Dr. Kidd, to talk a little bit about the, the current situation and what's going on with some of these programs as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Thank you for the report, as always, and thank you for your partnership on this committee. I really appreciate that. Um, so there are some concerns that we do have uh, two programs. As many of you know, Cal State University, Monterey Bay has closed its doors. And so those students have then since transferred uh, to other programs. And the University of Laverne, as we've talked about in a previous board meeting, has also um, uh, uh, withdrew uh, accreditation. And so that program will be closing as well. And these are typically Hispanic-serving institutions. And so the challenge there is that uh, we have a limited, um, with those two programs closing and Western University of Health Sciences not able to matriculate students, that is a considerable amount of PAs that we would not be putting into the workforce. And so we need to keep an eye on that as a board. Um, the accreditation cycle was pretty light, uh, this, this go around, but um, there's gonna be some upcoming reviews of the California programs. And so we wanna make sure that if there is any programs that potentially could be on probation, I will certainly articulate that here to the committee. But again, those two programs closing is a huge, huge hit uh, to the PA profession and producing very diverse mix of students uh, that would be going out and repatriating uh, into communities of need. So uh, something for us to watch as a board and to continue to look uh, at and hopefully the remaining programs will remain healthy and able to graduate students without any accreditation challenges. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. That concludes our report. Okay, thank you so much for the wonderful report and the insight. Are there any questions or comments from the PA board? I actually have um, a, a question. It seems though, so we have two institutions that have closed along with Western, and if I'm not mistaken, that puts out or decreases our um, number of PAs um, uh, graduating to about 200. I know. Western usually takes around 100, and usually most programs take around 50. Does that seem about right? So we have 98 uh, students that would normally matriculate into Western, um, and then there was 30 plus students that were matriculating into Cal State University, Monterey Bay, a similar number to the University of Laverne. Um, so yes, we are gonna have a significant decrease in the number of students entering the workforce, which again is a big challenge. We do have some developing programs that may buffer that a bit, right, as new programs come online. But again, we're always looking for a net increase rather than a net decrease right. in the number of folks entering uh, the workforce, given some of the lively discussions that we had earlier around the issue of primary care access. Excellent. All right, any other questions? Public comment? <coughs> Excellent, thank you guys for your wonderful report. Okay. Uh, an informative report. Um, moving on to item number 15, if that's correct. Uh, agenda items for the next meeting. Um, I believe our next meeting is dated November, it's a Friday, November 8th, is that correct? Okay. Um, I do think that um, we did an excellent uh, review of the ratio, so I don't need, we think we need to add that back on the agenda. Amen. <laughs> and then, um, does anybody have anything to include in the next meeting for the agenda? I will be bringing back the sunset draft report for uh, adoption. If I may add, um, so just a couple, I will be providing some data to Rosanna regarding Correct some of the demographic and PA workforce to be included within the Sunset Report, and surely that will be shared with the committee. 
I also would like to be added to the ledge committee, if that's possible. I don't think we have any PA representation on the legislative committee, and I would love to be on there. I do pay a lot of attention to those bills, as you know. Jasmine and I have quite a bit of uh, conversation back and forth <laughs> around those bills. Um, so I would love to be on the legislative committee if the board is in agreement. It was uh, Sonia Early and um, Jennifer Carlquist yes. mm -hmm. uh, with staff, but right, right now we don't have any board members on it. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we need two members for a committee, uh, or we can we have two, commi two, two committee, committee members. members? Yes. So, um, so thank you so much for offering. Um, mm -hmm. I was on that committee for years, and it was a robust, and I learned uh, quite a bit of information regarding our legislation and our uh, bill. So, thank you so much for joining, and thank you. we will. I don't think we need to vote on that, and so we'll add you to the. So, who are the lunch committee members? So it's going to be Ms. Dillon and Mr. D um, P Vice President Kidd. Oh, did you say we need two? Do we need members? two total or two? I'm not sure. Do we need two board members to be on the committee with staff? I thought can it was we have two. this discussion? <laughs> yes, sure. We're, we're, we're off the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Board, you okay. can appoint board members. Okay, uh, perfect. Members. Okay. okay. All right. So are, are there any other agenda items that we want to include for the next meeting other than those two? All right. And we will discuss that offline. Um, if not, anything else, we will move to closed session, which there is no closed session. Um, so at this point, I believe that our meeting is adjourned until the next physician assistant meeting, um, which will be November 8th. Um, that is a Friday in Sacramento. Um, so the adjournment for the meeting is current. Can I make a comment? You sure can. Um, I just want to state that I'm proud to be a member of a board where we can disagree and discuss this robustly in the same manner, which is yes. Absolutely. 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 I would have Absolutely. to agree. Absolutely. And so it is really nice to be a president and a board that can accurately, accurately discuss things passionately and empathetically um, and uh, come out friends and smiling and working well together to advance what we, the agenda is for California. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, so the meeting stands adjourned at 11.37 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Thank Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>